Act One of Hamilton by Mary P. Hamlin and George Arliss. Author's Preface This play is written for the stage. It is written with a desire to convey to the audience that the builders of the foundation of the American Republic were real people, and not merely a procession of nice gray-haired old gentlemen who were mainly occupied in sitting for their portraits to Gilbert Stuart and John Trumbull. Probably no keen admirer of Alexander Hamilton will be fully satisfied with the play. But the authors consoled themselves with the reflection that no playwright could do justice to the power and scope of this remarkable man within the limits of an evening's entertainment. In writing a play dealing with a great historical figure, it is necessary to select an incident that brings out boldly the predominant characteristics of the hero. Having decided upon the incident, it is advisable not to be fogged by the introduction of other important episodes, however much they may redound to the credit of the central figure, or however much you may be tempted to use them. Alexander Hamilton achieved distinction in so many different directions, as a shipping clerk, as a soldier, as a powerful and graceful writer, as an orator, as a tactician, as a master of the financial policy of nations, that to the casual reader of history it might seem difficult to discover this dominant characteristic. But to the student and lover of Hamilton it stands out clear and well-defined. Courage. Not the courage of the blind egoist or of the imperious politician, but the courage which had its roots in the love of truth and of honorable dealing. And so the authors chose the incident which forms the basis of this play. In their opinion, no single event could be found that displays this fine quality of courage more surely and more definitely than the course adopted by Hamilton in the face of the attack by his political enemies. Those descendants of Alexander Hamilton whom the authors have had the honor of meeting have expressed their satisfaction at the selection of this incident, and the authors feel that it is no breach of confidence to record that they have received words of praise from the two men who know more about Hamilton than perhaps anybody in America, two of his keenest admirers, Senator Lodge, and Nicholas Murray Butler. The historical record on which the play is founded can be seen by any student who is so far interested by applying to the Lenox Library in New York. It is known as the Reynolds Pamphlet, and is the document written by Alexander Hamilton himself. The play keeps very close to history. The main incidents are, in all essential details, historically correct. It has been necessary to take some few liberties, but these are of minor importance. The dialogue is not written precisely as it might have been spoken at the end of the 18th century. The authors believed that a slavish attempt to eliminate all words and phrases that were probably not in vogue at the time would result in many instances in tedious phraseology and a certain artificiality, which they particularly desired to avoid. They have, however, endeavored on the whole to maintain the atmosphere of the period. The stage directions are designed and intended for the guidance of the actors and not for the entertainment of the reader. There is a growing tendency among writers of plays to introduce long and humorous stage directions that are often very entertaining in the library, but very dangerous and misleading for the stage. They are misleading to a producer because they frequently make a scene appear to be very sparkling, while it is in reality exceedingly dull, the sparkle being confined exclusively to the stage directions. They are dangerous for the actor because they make him believe that his part is a great deal better than it really is, and so he is apt to regard his audience as stupid because their intelligence fails to appreciate subtleties that he detected at the reading. In reality, it is the author who is to blame. He has let the actors into certain dark secrets connected with their characters, without giving them the ghost of an opportunity, through the dialogue or situation, of conveying these confidences to the audience. The Players Alexander Hamilton Read by Thomas Peter. General Schuyler, read by Amelia Chesley. Thomas Jefferson, read by Wolfgang Bass. James Monroe, read by Alicia Messiah. William B. Giles, read by Donald Gilmore. Count Talleyrand, read by Delmar H. Dolbear. John Jay, Chief Justice, read by Joseph Tabler. Ezekiel, read by E. J. Wiley. James Reynolds, read by Chuck Williamson. Colonel Lear, read by Campbell Shelp. First Man, read by Nemo. Second Man, read by Eva Davis. Betsy Hamilton, read by Abai. 
Angelica Church, read by T.J. Burns. Mrs. Reynolds, read by Lian Yao. Soldier's Wife, read by phone. Melissa, read by phone. Stage Directions, read by Todd. Hamilton, Act One. Scene. The Exchange Coffee House in Philadelphia. A morning in August during Washington's first administration. It is a great room with low ceiling and neatly sanded floor. Against wall, back, are cupboards with shining pewter tankards and dishes. Center, a great fireplace with wide stone hearth and high back settles on each side. Running upright, table with chairs left of it at irregular intervals. Long seat right of table. Right, back, tub stands on floor and contains melons, cucumbers, bottles of wine, and a pitcher of milk cooling. Over fireplace is a large crimson silk liberty cap with these words above in large letters, Sacred to Liberty. On wall near is the following in large print. Breakfast, two shillings, fifty cents. Dinner with grog or toddy, three shillings, seventy-five cents. Quart of toddy, one and six, thirty-six cents. Bottle of porter, two and six, sixty cents. Best Madeira, six shillings a quart, one dollar fifty. Entrances upper right and left, also door left. A crowd of eight or ten men, including two or three Quakers, smoking church wardens, discovered sitting, standing, drinking. Mainly men of the better class, not rabble. Melissa, the barmaid, is serving drinks. Men come and go during act. James Reynolds, a handsome, dissipated ne'er-do-well of about thirty-five, slightly the worse for liquor, but not drunk, is center of a somewhat jeering crowd at top of table right. Monroe is up left, talking to some men. Giles is sitting at right of small table down left center. Giles is reading some manuscript, possibly a draft of a bill for Congress. As Gurdon rises, there is a general hubbub, Reynolds' voice dominant. First citizen is seated on downstage end of long seat right of table right. A second citizen is facing him, seated on a chair. Another is on his left further upon seat. Three men are standing in a group upstage right. An old man is seated on settle right of fireplace reading The Federalist. A man is seated on settle left of the fireplace. He is playing chess with another who is seated on a chair in front of him. The chessboard is on a small round table between them. Two Quakers are standing near the door on the left. Monroe is conversing with them. The original flag of the United States, thirteen stars in circle and thirteen stripes, is on wall above inner door on left back. The chairs are all Windsor chairs, dark in color, wainscoting about two feet six inches high. All woodwork in dark oak and walls and ceilings a neutral smoky gray. Round table, down stage left with three chairs round it, two armchairs and one single chair. The high back settles are set at an angle and start from the fireplace down stage on either side. They fit in between two thick upright posts which support a cross beam. Some more posts are suggested right and left at either end of beam. Against the post right is a chair. Three windows in right flat and one similar window in same position is in kitchen seen through entrance up right back. Shelves and bottles in kitchen. Through door left back is backing with door and beyond the street. At rise, Melissa is gathering up tankards and wiping off table right. Reynolds, standing on a chair at upper end of table right. I'm selling! I'm selling! First man, seated right of table, downstage end. Keep quiet there, will you? I'm selling, I'm selling, state securities for the price of printing. I'm selling, I'm selling. Can't hear ourselves speak. What's the use of keeping quiet? Where's a gentleman to do business if he can't do it at the exchange coffee house? Second man, seated down right other side of a table. Oh, where's the gentleman? Send the gentleman here. I'm the gentleman. <laughs> I'm sullen, I'm sullen, I'm sullen. Sit down. down. Melissa, a tankard of porter, my dear. I'm sullen, I'm sullen. Sit down, Reynolds. How can you be selling when there are no buyers? Enter Talleyrand up left at back. 
Ask that gentleman if he's nearly finished with the newspaper, Melissa. You see some business between Melissa and the man with the newspaper. He refuses to give it up. Melissa then meets Talleyrand, center at back. He has come on from street left. Reynolds, coming down stage center. Don't any of you gentlemen want to make easy money? I'm offering you state securities for the price of the printing. Here's a hundred dollars going to the highest bidder. Will anyone bid five? Holding up a paper. What state is it on? South Carolina. Laughter from the crowd. I'll give you sixpence for it. Louder laughter. Giles, seated right of round table, downstage left. Where'd you get all this paper all of a sudden, Reynolds? William P. Giles is a small, squat man, with swarthy, dirty-looking skin and a sharp eye. His features are thick and his manner coarse. His boots are heavy, his dress untidy, and his voice loud. He has the air of a successful bully and prize fighter. Reynolds, right downstage. I got it from the soldiers, Mr. Giles. The poor soldiers have entrusted me. Huh? They'll be very poor soldiers if they trust you. General laugh. Reynolds, reading from a second paper. Here's six months' pay due Private Hiram Mott. Ninety-six dollars due from the state of Virginia. Monroe, upstage left. That's not true, sir. Virginia's paid every cent she owes. James Monroe is a tall man, but because of broad shoulders and stocky build, looks shorter than he is. His manner is the aggressively plain citizen type. He is dressed plainly. He lacks Jefferson's gracious bearing, but does not reach Jaws's roughness. Ah, it's easy to see you come from Virginia, sir. But the poor soldiers. Poor soldiers? It's the fortune of war. Talleyrand has been settling the score with Melissa upstage. He speaks with a slight French accent. <laughs> the fortune of war. You bring about uh, this war, your soldiers fight for you and conquer your enemies, and then you repudiate their claim for pay. The fortune of war. Hmm? The war for them. <laughs> the fortune for you, huh? Some laughter. Reynolds mixes with men at back right. Talleyrand is very tall, with legs too small for his fat body. His blond hair is worn in long ringlets over his shoulders. His blue eyes, under heavy lids, have a look of scrutiny. His nose is pointed and aristocratic, but his mouth is large and coarse. His manner is watchful, but pleasant. He is dressed in the height of fashion. He wears a great hat with long curling black plume. When Reynolds goes to the men upright, two of them move away and go off up left. A third sits right of table. Reynolds then sits on sill of center window on right. Well, Talleyrand, I thought you had decided to return to France. Change your mind, eh? Rather risky yet for the aristocrats to go back. Coming down left of table left. I leave tomorrow. I am settling my score with the beautiful Melissa. One row, sitting left of table. You're going to take the chance, eh? Well, I hope to follow you in a very short time. Talleyrand, leaving Melissa, who curtsies and goes out upright. Do follow me, Senator Monroe? As minister to France. Talleyrand, back of table. Ah, yes, how charming. President Washington has already appointed you, hmm? Not yet, but we shall get it all right. We? Oui. Uh oh, you also? Hmm. Two ministers? No, not two ministers, but sometimes it takes two men to get one job. Enter Schuyler from street up left. He comes to center looking around. Ah, you mean it is not so easy? You have to deal with uh, Alexander Hamilton. We'll deal with him, all right. Alexander Hamilton. General Philip Schuyler is a large man, inclining to stoutness. He has a gouty foot and walks with a slight limp. His dress suggests the aristocrat. His manner is open and genial. He is a handsome, lovable old gentleman. He carries a handsome cane. Shh! Howdy, everybody. Two or three of the men say, Howdy, General. The second citizen rises and bows. Talleyrand goes to him effusively. Ah, General Schuyler, how are you? Schuyler, turning and bowing. Count Talleyrand. Talleyrand takes his two hands warmly. And how fares your illustrious son-in-law, Alexander Hamilton? 
Why, I guess he's all right. I've just come from Albany. I've been over to his house and find he's not at home. Giles moves a chair back of table left and shows Monroe papers. Ah, it is good for him to get away from his labors sometimes. Well, it's a queer thing for him to be away this time in the morning. Turning again to look around to the right, another man rises and says, Howdy, General. I thought he might be here. Reynolds, advancing effusively, taking off his hat and making a low bow. General Schuyler, now I'll sell you one of these. Schuyler ignores him and turns back to Talleyrand. Reynolds goes up to behind table, laughing. Everybody calls here. Yes, everybody comes to see everybody at the Exchange Coffee House. <laughs> I find it amusing. It is club, restaurant, merchants exchange, everything. Enter Melissa with drinks, places them on the table right. I will alter all that in time, Count Talleyrand. We're young, you know. Give Alexander Hamilton time to sow some seeds. We'll have a real merchants exchange and a real live country that will be able to pay its debts. Ugh. Twinge of gout. Melissa gets chair from in front of post right and brings it down right of Schuyler, replacing it against table, then taking tray with other drinks across to table down left, giving one to Giles and one to Monroe. And I hope I shall have a real foot, which I haven't at this moment. And if you don't mind, Melissa, my girl, I'll just rest it in the parlor before I hobble along. Good day to you, Count Talleyrand. Going left. I shall call on Alexander before I leave. He'll be extremely glad to see you. <laughs> Confound this foot. Goes off right. Reynolds, who has been drinking and conversing with one or two shady-looking characters, coming to him. Count Talleyrand. Before you return to La Belle France, wouldn't you like to buy up the whole of the French loan? I'll sell it to you for ten cents. Laughter. Enter left from street, Thomas Jefferson. He is a man over six feet tall. His red hair is unpowdered. He has pointed features and a freckled face. His corduroy breeches are well worn. Jefferson, coming down stage center. A good day to you, citizens. First man rises and says, Good day, Mr. Jefferson. One or two other men say, Mr. Jefferson. Melissa, coming forward with a curtsy to left of Jefferson. Good day to you, Mr. Jefferson. Good day to you, Melissa. And how is your father today? Mandin, I hope? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. No honor for me. Just a plain citizen, Melissa. Tell him I asked after him. Moving toward table left. Thank you, sir. Curtsies and is going right. Jefferson, turning slightly, raising finger in protest. And leave off the sir. Yes, sir. Jefferson laughs, slightly amused. A little Madeira now, Melissa. She goes hurriedly right and exits. Citizen Monroe? Shakes hands. Good day to you, Citizen Giles. Does not shake hands with Giles. Howdy, Tom Jefferson. Jefferson, turning in front of table. Oh, Citizen Talleyrand. Talleyrand coming down center. Count Talleyrand, if you please. In America there are no titles, Citizen Talleyrand. In this land of the free, all men are equal. And they say titles ain't so very popular in France just now. Jefferson, sitting right of table left. Ah, France, what a glorious change. The apostle of liberty and fraternity. Liberty? Fraternity? <laughs> what do you mean by liberty, Mr. Jefferson? Jefferson points to cap over mantle. Well, ask your own countrymen, Citizen Talleyrand. There you behold the symbol of the liberty of your great land of France. To us in America, that crimson cap stands as a symbol of freedom, a symbol Cause that dirty rag a symbol of liberty? I call it a symbol of license, of lawlessness, of murder. What say you, Thomas Jefferson, to the murder of my king, Louis of France? Is that too a symbol of liberty, of fraternity? It is the will of the people. The time is not far distant, citizen Talleyrand, when every king in Europe will have been swept into the dust heap of history. Approval from the crowd. 
Louis the Sixteenth was an oppressor of the people. A tyrant. Yes, sir. Talleyrand to Jefferson. You say that? You who for five years were minister of France and enjoyed his friendship. You who have sat at his table. And it was necessary to use the arm of the people. Fate decreed that your newly founded republic should be cemented with the blood of aristocrats. Down with aristocrats. Down with tyrants everywhere. Yes, I know your idea of liberty. Down with aristocrats. Down with everybody who is in your way. I'll tell you one thing, Citizen Tolerant, and I'll tell it to you now. There are some damned aristocrats in this country that will get the same treatment your king got if they don't go careful. Who helped you win your freedom? The king of France. Well, we ain't going to have any kings in this country. Who desires to be king? George Washington does. And Alexander Hamilton wants to be prime minister. Wants to be? He is prime minister this very minute. Prime minister of America. Huh. By this time, everybody in the room is listening. Jefferson, conciliatory. Oh, I assure you, Citizen Talleyrand, Citizen Giles, and Citizen Monroe voice the sentiments of the great body of the American people. Murmurs of assent from the crowd. There is a growing unrest all over this land at the aristocratic tendencies of our president. There is a bitter and righteousness opposition to Alexander Hamilton's efforts to centralize the government and assume the debts of the 13 free and independent states. Such a centralization of power would inevitably lead to monarchy. And I stand on the platform of the rights of man, the rights of the individual, the rights of each state to its freedom. And I tell you, citizen Talleyrand, the gravest danger that threatens America today rests in the persons of those men who are striving to centralize the power of the United States, striving to establish a military dictatorship. Approval from crowd at table right. One man strikes the table to emphasize his agreement. A condition that will involve us in European quarrels in which it should be our policy to take no part. How can you keep out of European quarrels when your interests are bound up with those of Europe? Our riches and resources can bid defiance to any power on earth. It is only when our rights are invaded that we should make preparation for our defense. Talleyrand with a shrug. Yes, and then uh, it will be perhaps too late. Citizen Talleyrand. I look for the day when, during the rage of eternal wars in Europe, the lion and the lamb within our regions shall lie down together in peace. Talleyrand, down beside Jefferson. Yes, they would lie down together. Until the lion felt hungry, then he would get up and eat the lamb. Laughter from crowd. Against this tendency towards centralization, we who love the freedom of our own state will fight to the death. Talleyrand, moving to center. Yes. Thirteen jealous states all working against each other. How are you going to pay your debts without a central government? You have no credit abroad. Your paper is not worth five cents on the dollar. Why don't you pay the men who furnished you supplies for your war? Why don't you pay the soldiers who gained you that liberty that you love so dearly? Damn the soldiers. This country's going to put a stop to Washington's coddling of the army. Talleyrand, advancing a little to Giles. It was the soldiers who won you your precious freedom. Well, Virginia's paid her soldiers. Talleyrand, coming down on Monroe's level. Has South Carolina? Has Rhode Island? That's no affair of Virginia. No, sir. Why not? Did not the soldiers of Rhode Island help Virginia to her liberty? Each one fought for the common good. Each one should be paid. By that, Citizen Talleyrand, I understand you to mean that the government should assume the war debts of all the states. Those debts were the price of your liberty. If you have a government, it should pay the country's debts. Oh, Citizen Talleyrand, you're simply speaking from Alexander Hamilton's platform. You're an aristocrat. Some of the crowd agree with this. So's Hamilton. Talleyrand shrugs his shoulders and moves to right center.
And as such, you cannot possibly understand the love of liberty that burns in the heart of every loyal American. Rising and coming to Talleyrand. This attempt by Alexander Hamilton to compel the central government to assume the death of the 13 states is merely a trick, a maneuver, to give a greater power to that central body and to ruthlessly crush the freedom of the states. We as Virginians love Virginia, her freedom, and will fight for her freedom. Moves back to his chair. Talleyrand, coming toward him. Fight, mon dieu! Where were you when Alexander Hamilton stormed the redoubts at Yorktown? Well, as you know, citizen Talleyrand, I'm not a soldier. Sits. Giles, wicking at Monroe. Jefferson has never been a fighter, you know, citizen Talleyrand. Citizen, citizen, citizen! You prate and boast about the rights of man and sneer at Alexander Hamilton as an aristocrat. Have any of you worked for the rights of man as he has? When it was an affair of fighting for your liberty, he fought. At the age of nineteen, twenty years, he had risen to be colonel and was leading the victorious charge at Yorktown. At the hour when your liberty was assured, he laid down his arms and commenced to make a nation of you. I tell you, I have known all the great men of my time. Pitt, Fox, Washington, and of them all. It is my boast that I know Alexander Hamilton. Adieu. He sweeps out, left exit to the street. During the following dialogue, there is general movement and talking amongst the crowd. Some laugh tolerantly, others shake their heads in doubt. The first man rises, and bowing to the man he has been talking to, crosses to the man at the fireplace who is reading the paper, has a few words with him, and then exits upright. The man he has been speaking to, downright, rises and is joined by the man who has been sitting on the other side of the table, right. They take arms and stroll out up left, chatting as they go. One of the Quakers goes into the street left, and the other comes to center and watches the men who were playing chess. He afterwards sits in the upper corner of settle left of fireplace. Reynolds strolls up and takes down a pipe from mantel. He chats a moment with a soldier who is sitting left of table right. The man who was reading the paper goes off right, leaving the paper on settle. Why, the crazy... Hush. He's right, friends, he's right. Hamilton is a great man. But his energies are misdirected. Rises and moves to center. Great man? Why, you ain't got half the following you have. That infernal French aristocrat has put the whole thing in a nutshell. Hamilton and Washington are working against the interests of the individual. They're working against us. During this, Melissa enters from right with a glass of Madeira, puts it on table left, and then, crossing over to post right, she hangs a card on it. It is a notice of a ship's sailing. Reynolds has some business of flirting with her. He slips his arm through hers. She resents and exits left. Reynolds goes off upright. Well, come, come. We mustn't say that. Well, it's true. That may be, but... Well, what are you going to do about it? Jefferson to Melissa. Oh, thank you, my dear. He and Monroe drink. As they drink, Reynolds flirts with Melissa, see above. Citizen Monroe, I, I came in hope of finding you here this morning because I have decided that it's necessary that you and I should make a friendly call upon Alexander Hamilton. During dialogue, the two men who have been playing chess rise and consult the card Melissa has hung up. One of them makes some notes. They exchange a few words, bow to each other, and go off up right and left. The Quaker remains on settle, left a fireplace, reading from a small book. A friendly call. To consolate him. With what object? We need his cooperation. Sits again. The decision of the location of the capital of the United States is now a matter of urgent necessity. It is vitally necessary that we should secure the capital for the South where our influence is paramount. Don't see any need to worry about that. The North hasn't got any chance anyway. Why, Washington's a Virginian if he is under Alexander Hamilton's thumb. Giles, rising. George Washington ain't got a damn bit of loyalty in him. Well, come, come. I cannot discuss this matter with you, citizen Giles, unless you refrain from your invective. 
Well, he's a Virginian, and yet he's just as interested in New York and Massachusetts as he is in Virginia. It makes me sick. A soldier who has been sitting left at table right rises and goes off upright, smiling. The capital of the United States doesn't go to the north as long as James Monroe has a fight in him. Let us consider our own position. Hamilton is straining every nerve to pass through Congress his bill for the government assumption of states' debts. Reynolds appears at door upright, smoking a pipe. He leans against door a minute, then comes to post right and pretends to be reading the card while he listens. It's an outrage. Let every state pay for its own debts. Well, we're blocking that bill, and we'll continue to block it to the last ditch. Giles sits back of table left. Without our cooperation, which we cannot possibly extend, his bill cannot go through. Then what's the use of us going to ask favors of him when he knows perfectly well that we are the most active opponents of his bill? I say, fight him. I believe you're right, Giles. Fight him. Jefferson, coming toward table, left. Come, come, Monroe. More flies may be caught with a dish of molasses than with a sea of vinegar. You know, you've set your heart on being appointed minister to France. I have. Hamilton word will go a long way with Washington. Reynolds turns his head slightly toward them. Then, picking up paper, sits on seat right of fireplace and reads, removing his hat which he places beside him. Come, we'll make a friendly call. Hamilton will fight tooth and nail to have the capital in New York. That may be. Hamilton is a New Yorker. Giles sneers. Is he? He comes from God knows where. Shh, shh. A bastard born in the... Monroe and Jefferson protest. Jefferson rises. We don't need to discuss his arrival into the world, Giles. I am far more interested in his removal. Reynolds turns chair in front of him and puts his feet on it. Jefferson, moving to center... We must be prepared for his opposition to the South. It will be a lasting disgrace to this country if the capital is not in Virginia. Uh, too remote, Monroe. You see, we have no post roads, and inaccessible from New England. Damn it, ain't you working for Virginia? I'm afraid we cannot hope for Virginia. I believe, though, if we go carefully, there is a chance of getting it for the South. Where? On Potomac. Well, that's a damn sight better New York. Jefferson, coming back to table. Well, come, we will call on Hamilton this evening. A friendly call, after supper, perhaps. But remember, we must steer clear of any mention of his bill for the government assumption of state deaths. It doesn't suit me to go begging to Hamilton. He's got the president wound round his little finger. And the people trust him. Shake the people's faith in him, that's the thing. Reynolds lowers his paper a moment. His honest, Giles. We've tested his honesty. Yes, the Anti-Federalists have attacked his honesty as Secretary of the Treasury from every possible angle, and he's always beaten us. We ain't used up our whole bag of tricks yet, not by a damn sight. Jefferson, with a slight look of disapproval at Giles, then, Citizen Monroe, we will meet here this evening at nine. Monroe rises. We will make a late call on Hamilton, as I wish our visit to be regarded scarcely as one related to business. He goes up to street door left. Giles, scratching chin. If we could only make the people believe that Hamilton, the Secretary of the Treasury, ain't playing fair with the gate money, why, we'd have the whole country in our pockets. Reynolds can be observed listening. Enter Schuyler from parlor left, followed by Melissa. At sound of Schuyler's voice, Giles rises, and crossing the table right, puts his foot up on a chair and thinks. I think I'll be hobbling off, Melissa. My regards to your father. Melissa crosses Schuyler to chessboard at fireplace. Good day to you, citizen Schuyler. Returning from street door. Schuyler, at post left of fireplace. How do you do, Mr. Jefferson? How do you do, Senator Monroe? And how's the gout? Well, it's... Ugh. Oh, I can't tell you in the presence of this young lady. 
Melissa, taking pipes off chest table, moves over to table right, picks up some jugs, and exits upright. Monroe, coming up left. We were just talking about your son-in-law, Alexander Hamilton. Ugh, uh, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, Mrs. Hamilton is not back from England yet. No, Betsy's not back yet. I understand she went over to see your other daughter, who was sick. I trust she's better. Yes, she's all right now, thank God. Mr. Jefferson and I propose to drop in and see Alexander Hamilton tonight. I hope that he is well. Yes, he's as well as you fellows will let him be. Monroe, a step towards him, angrily. What do you mean by that, General Schuyler? Schuyler, responding with anger. You know what I mean. Monroe goes up to street door left. Jefferson, between them and laughing. Come, come, do not let us quarrel. We are coming in to have a little chat with Citizen Hamilton concerning the location of the capital. Schuyler looks interested. Citizen Schuyler, I bid you a good day, sir. Good day to you, Citizen Giles. Good day. Good day. Exit Jefferson and Monroe to left through a street door. Give my love to Alexander. Grins. Schuyler looks after Jefferson and Monroe and then at Giles. You're cooking something for him between you, and you're the chief stoker. I'm a fighter, if that's what you mean. Yes, you're a fighter, but a damned sportsman. When your party wants to circulate any damnable insinuations about Alexander Hamilton, they go to Giles of Virginia, and he does the dirty work. Giles turns. Because you and your gang know that Alexander has the confidence of the people, and that he means to make the government assume the state's debts, you are forever trying to trip him up, shouting corruption in the treasury, dishonesty in the treasury, and God knows what. Moving toward left and turning again. I don't say who's the author of the accusations. I don't say it's Tom Jefferson or Senator Monroe, but I know where to put my hand on the man who does the dirty work. Giles crosses angrily toward him. Yes, you're a fighter. But you know only one knockout blow, and that's the one below the belt. You needn't glare at me. I wouldn't soil my hands with you. But this is one of the times when I wish I had gout anywhere but in my foot. Exit Schuyler left to street. Giles thinks hard and looks ugly. Then laughs and comes down to right of table left and drinks. Reynolds, who has been listening and enjoying the row, says meditatively, Shake the people's faith in him. Giles, turning to him. What'd you say? Reynolds, smiling. Shake the people's faith in him. You've been listening, huh? Well, that's the only way to get a living, Mr. Giles. Keeping my ears open. Picking up his hat from beside him. Well, keep your mouth shut. Sits right of table left and chews a toothpick. Reynolds, rising and coming to center, slowly laughing. Pretty hard job to shake the people's faith in Alexander Hamilton, ain't it? Mind your own damn business. Reynolds laughs and crosses the chair back of a table left, puts his hat down on table. <laughs> You've tried to prove him incompetent. You've tried to prove him dishonest. But there's one thing you haven't tried, Mr. Giles. Back of table. Giles, turning away from him. Go to the devil. And it's strange you haven't thought of it. How about a woman? Giles is silent a moment. Rolls toothpick around in his mouth. Spits it out. Replaces it with another. And then looks at Reynolds. You're a little gentleman, ain't you, Reynolds? Women are the deuce for tangling up a man's finances. You know all about it, don't you? Yes, I know a great deal about women. I'm married, you know. Yes, I know. I know a good deal about men, too. Now, Mrs. Hamilton is away. Been away a long time in England. Now, what do you say... Giles, turning away. I don't want any advice from you. Besides, as you know so much, you know that Hamilton hardly ever leaves his house. Makes it all the easier. Send the woman to the house. Giles, looking in front of him. What the devil do you mean? It's a matter of choosing the right woman and the right moment. 
puts down pipe and leans forward. You've seen Mrs. Reynolds, haven't you? Your wife? Yes. Giles, turning squarely toward him. God, you're a bad one, ain't you? Reynolds, leaning back and smiling. I'm what may be called a soldier of fortune, Mr. Giles. You'd come in on the blackmailing end of the game, huh? You'd do any damned thing for a ten-dollar piece, wouldn't you? Yes. I'm afraid my price is a little lower than yours, Mr. Giles. Leans forward again. You might see Mrs. Reynolds. She's a nice little thing. I'm very fond of her. But she's too good for me. Giles, looking in front of him again. Oh? Yes. It's the clothes, you know, that cause the trouble. She must have pretty clothes. She's young, you see. She... Noticing that Giles is interested, he takes a pen and writes on a slip of paper, rises and puts the paper on Giles's knee. That's our address, Mr. Giles. Reynolds, picking up his hat, moves towards door left. She be at home now? Looking at paper. Reynolds, smiling and coming back a step. Yes, I think so. You've seen her with me, haven't you? Yes. She's a pretty little thing, ain't she? Giles looks at him sideways. She's a clever little thing, too. <laughs> well, good day, Mr. Giles. Exit Reynolds, left. Giles remains looking at the paper, apparently thinking it over. He reaches for his hat, which is on the table beside him, rises with sudden determination, puts his hat on, looks again at the paper, then with his mind made up, he exits quickly through the street door up left. Curtain. End of Act One. Act Two of Hamilton by Mary P. Hamlin and George Arliss. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two. Scene. Living room in the house of Alexander Hamilton, 79 South 3rd Street, Philadelphia, evening of the same day. It is a large room in a brick house of the period. Wallpaper dull gray, white wainscoting. Doors solid mahogany, white frames with cut glass handles. Woodwork of windows and fireplace handsomely carved and painted white. Room suggests dignity and comfort rather than elegance. The furniture is Chippendale. Portraits of General and Mrs. Schuyler on the wall at back. Upstage right, there is a door leading to a hall and street door which can be seen by audience. Down left, a door leading to other parts of the house. Left center, at back, two long French windows give out on narrow iron balcony on front of house. A third window is on the right upstage. Light through window suggests street lamp without. Large and small chairs stand about. At left front, stands a large carved mahogany chair. It is handsomely upholstered in leather. At left center, a large low writing table with a pile of manuscript at one end and furnished with ink and quill pens. The fireplace is on the right downstage. On mantel stands a handsome wedgewood vase and one silver four-branch candlestick. Above mantel, a large mirror. Between fireplace and window upright, a small square mahogany table against the wall. Green rep and lace curtains at all windows. Down right, center facing audience, a colonial sofa. Against wall, center at back, is a mahogany bookcase filled with books, no doors on case. Standing on bookcase are two two-branch silver candlesticks. The two portraits are on the wall above. Right and left of bookcase, a chair. In left corner upstage, a handsome colonial escotier, open. Armchair in front of escotier. Against wall left and above door, a similar smaller bookcase. Two single candlesticks on ditto. Armchair back of Hamilton's table left center. Single chair right of table. Chair against wall below door down left. Ditto against wall below fireplace down right. Small chair back of sofa. When the curtain goes up, Alexander Hamilton is discovered standing at right of table left center, looking over a manuscript of Bill for Congress. He is a man of medium height. Thirty-three years of age. He is dressed in the height of fashion. In spite of heat, his ruffles are immaculate and his stock secure. 
he wears his own hair unpowdered and tied in a queue with a black ribbon. Enter left, Zekio, an elderly Negro serving man. Zekio, at door left. Excuse me, Ma Hampton, but that's mighty nine nine o'clock. Is it Zekio? It certainly am, sir. Well, what of it? Zekio, coming toward him. Colonel, you ain't had scarcely no food all day, and that fetch me. Den has been waiting these four hours. Has it? Well, bring it in here. Sits back of table, left center. Hi, y'all don't eat at all then, sir. Yo just looks at it and goes on walking. Hamilton, making correction on Bill. I'm engaged on a difficult task, Uncle. You sure must be, Martha Hampton. Trying to make bricks without straw. Bricks. That certainly do seem a mighty poor substitute for dinner, Martha Colonel. Knock. Ezekiel crosses it back towards door right. I'm still out, Ezekiel. Ezekiel, turning it right. Reckon you all better be home, Marcel Colonel, and quit working for tonight. I'm out, Ezekiel. I'm out. Ezekiel goes out right, half closes room door. Skylar heard. Skylar, without. What? Still out? I'll come in, Uncle, and wait. Coming through hall door. Ezekiel, as Skylar stumps in. So help me, General. Tain't no good, you're waiting. Enter General Skylar, right. Ezekiel backing in before him, trying to prevent him. Hamilton, who has gotten up as soon as he heard voice. Why, Father, I've been expecting you for hours. Meeting him upright, taking his hands and bringing him into the room. Well, I called on you hours ago. To Ezekiel. You black nigger, you. I don't believe he's been out at all. Ezekiel, down right of Schuyler. Why, he say he were out, and I done think he were. Hamilton, left of Schuyler. Uncle, I thought you knew I was expecting the general. I don't know nothing except what you tells me. So help me, Martha Hampton. Shut street door and returns, closing room door also. I'm sorry, Father. Do You see, as Secretary of the Treasury, I'm a target for all kinds and conditions of people. Placing the chair right of table a little further out for Schuyler. Schuyler, sitting, left center. People who come to borrow money, eh? Hamilton, giving Schuyler's hat to Ezekiel. Exactly. That's why I have to be out, out, out. You see, there is still a large section of the public who regard the Treasury as a sort of savings bank, from which they can withdraw money without the preliminary inconvenience of depositing it. Helping Schuyler off with his cloak and giving it to Ezekiel. Schuyler, having risen to take off cloak, Sits again. Well, the people are slow to understand. It's only the last few years that we've had a treasury. Yes, we have a treasury, but we haven't any treasure. How's the gout? How do I find Colonel Hamilton? That's what I want to know. I'm perfectly well. Puts his hand across his eyes. But I believe I'm tired. Crossing down left. Ezekiel, advancing to right center from behind sofa... He ain't had no victuals since morning, General. Ah, perhaps that's it. I believe I'm hungry. Schuyler, turning angrily to Ezekiel. Didn't Mrs. Hamilton charge you before she went away to see that the Colonel ate his meals regularly? Hamilton, laughing, passes up between Schuyler and table, giving Schuyler an affectionate shake as he passes, then puts away papers. Yes, sir. Miss Betsy, she charged me, but for God, Master Schuyler, I can't get him to eat scarcely a mouthful. So that's the way you look after your master, is it? Sometimes, General. Yo can tack and lead a mule up to the trough. Hamilton, tying up papers, protests, laughingly. But if he tack it into his head not to drink, well, y'all can't do nothing about it. Uncle, you never said a word about drink. You've been worrying me to eat all day. To Schuyler. What do you think I've been doing, Father? The Lord knows. Everybody's work, as usual, I suppose. I've been building a national bank. Place his hand on large bundle of manuscript. Well, you can't do it on an empty stomach. Why not? I'm doing it on an empty treasury. Goes up to Esquitier with papers. Schuyler to Ezekiel, who is going towards door right. Uncle Zeke, you go and get up the best supper you know how, and I'll see that the colonel eats it. And a bottle of wine. Ezekiel puts cloak and hat down on chair right of bookcase on back wall and brings small table from at wall right, and places it center beside Schuyler. Hamilton, at Escotier up left. 
You'll join me in that. No, I've got a milk-fed foot. <laughs> milk for General Scott. Yes, sir. Ezekiel exits left, happy. Hamilton, sitting on edge of table, left of Schuyler. Well, what news? You saw General Washington. He's in the lowest depths of depression, Alexander. About the financial conditions. He's not as young as you, you know. He was born to fight, but not to fight politicians. Well, I'm going to do the fighting now. Picks up pens. Here's a whole new bundle of pens, and I'm going to stick a man with every one of them. The opposition have half a dozen bundles to your one, and they poison the points. That's just it. They use too many pens, and so the poison fails to take effect. I've got them sticking all over me, and I can't even feel them. But Washington feels them. They're always attacking him. The latest is an accusation that he is drawing more salary than he is entitled to. Whose work is that? Tom Paine's? No, the clerk of the house. But Tom Paine has written him a letter, too, accusing him of incompetence calling him treacherous in private friendship, a hypocrite in public life. Sounds like Tom Paine. And heaven knows what besides. Ungrateful scoundrels. The thing that hits him hardest is their everlasting hooting about the army. George Washington loves his army as he would have loved an only child. He has beggared himself in an attempt to meet the country's promise to pay. It's the old story. The greater the achievement of the man, the more violent his detractors. Enter Ezekiel, left, with tray containing chicken, bread and butter, jug of milk, glass, bottle of wine, wine glass, napkin, and white cloth on tray. Now they are shouting dictator and accusing him of trying to make himself king. And they know it's a lie. Crossing down left angrily. Of course it's a lie. That's why the politicians glory in it. You can't lead the people with a lie. The truth. Takes more papers from table and puts them away in escotia. Uncle Zeke, I hope you hear your master talking about the value of telling the truth. It will do you good. Ezekiel, having placed tray on table center. For God, Master General, the only lie I ever tell is to say Master Hampton's out when he's in, and surely that's a mighty white lie. For a gentleman of your color. Well, Ezekiel... If anyone calls, I'm in for tonight. Unless they want money out of the treasury. Ezekiel, taking chair from left of bookcase at back and placing it back of table center. Very well, Master Hamilton. You's in for tonight. Now you eat that our dinner, and I'll bring your mo to follow. Exit Ezekiel, taking Skylar's hat and cloak. Now, what have we here? Chicken. Hamilton, at Escotier. Ah! And bread and butter. Damn it, there's no pie. Hamilton, coming over. Good heavens, no pie. Ezekiel! I'll wager he's gone to get the pie. Well, it doesn't seem much to go building banks on. How can I build banks without pie? It's time Betsy came back. Thank God she will be home next week. Hamilton, standing back of table, center. Haven't you had a letter by the last packet? No. Why, I've been on the road from Albany the last five days. What's wrong? Hamilton, taking out letter from breast pocket. Nothing wrong. But Betsy writes to say that Angelica isn't able to come as soon as they expect it. It will be another month before they are here. He kisses letter. It's a damn shame the way you've been left with no one to look after you. Go on and eat. Betsy had no sort of business to go off and leave you at all. I say it if she is my own daughter. Why, you begged and prayed of her to go. Well, she ought to be back. She's coming back. Heaven knows I miss Betsy. Puts letter on tray and sits down. Schuyler, fuming. President Washington leans on you like a child on its mother. And not a soul in this whole town sees to it that you have any... any... Fumes. Any pie. Eat, I say. Eat. Knock. Now there's somebody else. Hope that nigger has sense enough to say you're out. Hamilton, opening napkin. Come on then, join me. I'm hungry as a hunter. Passes milk. There's your milk. 
Milk. Bah. Enter Ezekiel. Ezekiel at door right, closing it behind him. Woman seen in hall as he enters. Here's the poor woman at the door with a baby in her arms. She wants to see you, sir. Is yo in or is yo out? Out. What does she want? She says it's how she's the wife of one of the soldiers. Hamilton to Schuyler. You see, she comes to me for money. Money out of the treasury. I'll see her, uncle. Schuyler objects, but Zekiel opens door. Can't send her away, father. Drops napkin on tray and rises and goes up toward door right. Schuyler mutters. You can't live without food. What's the use? Enter woman with baby in her arms. She comes from the hall. The street door is closed. Ezekiel half closes the room door and remains in the room holding the doorknob. Woman has a state certificate in her hand. What can I do for you? Upstage center, left of woman. Woman, coming to right center. Are you Colonel Hamilton? Yes. Pulling the chair he was sitting on. Sit down. She sits. What is it? My husband is Zachary Whalen, sir. He fought in a war, sir. He's a cripple and can't work. He fought under you, sir. It was that winter at Valley Forge. His feet froze so many times, sir. He's on a pension, but we can't get the money. Can't get it from your state? We get it sometimes, but not lately at all. Only promises, sir. You see, ours is due from Rhode Island. If it had been Virginia or New Hampshire, it'd have been all right, because they are paying their men, but Rhode Island says they can't. Hamilton looks toward Schuyler. What do you wish me to do? I heard General Washington spoke at a meeting of the soldiers last night, and he gave his word that everyone would be paid. I know he will keep his word, sir, but we can't wait. Hamilton, kindly. Why did you come to me? They told me that you were Secretary of the Treasury, where all the money is. Hamilton, giving another hopeless look at Schuyler, who grunts. I wish I could make you understand. The Treasury at present is only a name. An empty name. Takes paper from woman. This is Rhode Island's promise to pay. Mrs. Whalen, I am trying to make the country keep this promise. I'm trying to make them pay. How long shall we have to wait, sir? I don't know. Here. Trying two waistcoat pockets before finding it. Take this. Gives her a coin and certificate. She wraps coin and certificate and puts it in her breast. Thank you, sir. She is going, but turns when he speaks. Hamilton, following her a step or two. I can only say that I'll do my best to see that you are paid. You're hungry, aren't you? Yes, sir. Hamilton takes four corners of napkin and ties chicken inside and hands to her. Here, take this chicken and have a jolly good supper with your husband. I'm afraid there isn't much for the... He leans over and tenderly removes a corner of the shawl from the head of the sleeping baby. What's the baby's name? Elizabeth, sir. Hamilton, smiling. Elizabeth, is it? Yes, sir. Hamilton, taking a jug of milk from Schuyler, who is about to pour some out. The baby's name is Betsy, father. Gives jug to woman. Milk for Elizabeth. Ezekiel and Schuyler very protesting. Ezekiel, show Mrs. Whalen out. Tell your husband I'm fighting for the men who fought for me. And it's a harder struggle than we had at Valley Forge. But that I mean to win as we won at Yorktown. Ezekiel opens room door and also street door, which he holds open. Woman, near room door. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry to have troubled you, but it's hard on the women. When the war broke out, we had to let our men go, and proud we were of them. And when my husband came back disabled and useless, everybody took him by the hand and helped him. That was when the war was on, but now it's finished. It's hard we can't get paid. Good night, sir. Exit woman, right. Hamilton, turning to Schuyler with a groan. The disgrace of it. The men who won our freedom left to starve. Moving down stage into fireplace impatiently. If Tom Jefferson and those damned anti-federalists would let your assumption bill go through, why the soldiers would be paid. Hamilton, walking excitedly across to left, their opposition to this bill is holding the country in the grip of bankruptcy. While Jefferson and Monroe oppose it, you'll never get it through. Hamilton, back of his table, picking up manuscript. 
I'll fight for it. I'll fight for it to the end. Throwing down manuscript and crossing it back to right. You see, father, Jefferson never smelt the smoke of battle. No, he prides himself on being a man of peace. All he and his flock do is go around shouting states' rights. Thomas Jefferson and the rights of man. He gets his followers to do the shouting while he writes for posterity. Placing his chair right of small table. Schuyler, grudgingly. Yes, he writes well. Hamilton, standing right center. He writes music. The music of well-chosen words. And the people listen to him. We all listen to Tom Jefferson's music. He's like the Pied Piper. He pipes and he pipes. The people follow spellbound. He can certainly pipe. Of course, there is always the danger that he will lead them into the sea. Well, there's a lot of rats running after him that it'd be all the better for drowning. There are always rats running up the back stairs trying to nibble their way into office. Enter Ezekiel from door upright, comes down to table center. Wouldn't be if the offices were kept clean. Only a strong government can keep the offices clean. This policy of every man for himself is leading the country to anarchy. He is very angry. Ezekiel, a little alarmed. Reckon I better get you some more supper, Colonel. Picks up tray. Note. Betsy's letter is on tray. Be sure to bring it back on tray next time. Don't you get me any more of that damned milk. Maybe I'd just better fetch a little in a feeding bottle, General. <laughs> yeah. Exit Zekiel, laughing. Hamilton laughs and sits right of table, center. When Zekiel lied to me this morning and said you were out, I went round to the exchange coffee house. To get a milk punch? To look for you. I saw several of the rats there, and I'm convinced they're hatching something for you. I always associate hatching with chickens, but I dare say rats do it. Well? Be on your guard. Jefferson and Monroe are coming to see you about the location of the Capitol. Hamilton, unconcerned. Oh, the residence bill. Takes out handkerchief. Well, what about it? Schuyler, sitting back, nettled. What about it? I mean, where do they want the Capitol? In Jefferson's parlor, I suppose. That's just where they do want it. They want the Capitol of the United States... In the South. My God. But, excuse me. Schuyler, fuming. My God! Is that the end of your prayer, or the beginning, Father? The South! Well, why not? Do you mean to say you'd let the capital of the United States go to the South? Where do you think it should be? Where should it be? Why, Albany, of course. Hamilton, jumping out of his chair and over to right, laughing heartily. (laughs) Oh, your hometown. The finest city on God's earth. (laughs) In your parlor, I suppose. No, General, certainly not Albany. Sits in chair again. Schuyler, nettled. Oh, certainly not Albany, eh? And why certainly not Albany? I suppose you want it in New York. Ezekiel enters left and, crossing it back to door upright, exits. New York? No. Well, in heaven's name, where do you want it? Anywhere that's handy to get at. Well, I'll be. Haven't you any patriotism, man? I don't care where the capital is. Or whether it's built of marble or whether it's made of wood, so long as we get the right men inside to restore law and order to this limping, half-starved government. Alexander. Hamilton pulling his chair around to face Schuyler and anticipating amusement. What are the reasons why the capital should be in the North? Why all the traditions connected with our struggle for independence cluster about the North. Hamilton, taking it off on his fingers. There's some truth in that. It was here in Philadelphia that the Declaration of Independence was signed. Hamilton, checking on fingers. So it was. It was in New York that Washington took the oath of office. Hamilton checks. In New York, the government had its beginning. Why, Albany commands the commerce of the four corners of the earth. Hamilton, checking. Hmm. And there's not a damned bit of reason why the South should have it anyway. But if the North has all the glory of the traditions of the past, 
Isn't it a good reason why the South should be glorified with the hopes of the future? No! Hamilton rises. Hasn't the South, at any rate, as much claim as the North? No! Enter Ezekiel, right. General, your argument is... Secretary Jefferson and Senator Monroe calling to see you, sir. Reckon you's out? I reckon I'm in, Ezekiel. Skyler, rising. Now here they come to talk to you about the Capitol, and you're going to concede it without a struggle. Hamilton, coming to him. Father, you're the best friend I have in the world, but I daren't trust you in a matter of diplomacy. That's no reflection on your intelligence, because, you know, diplomacy is frequently only one-eighth brain. Tapping him on the forehead. And seven-eighths the way you use it. I'm going to send you out onto the balcony to cool down. Going up toward center window. I just got some old supper ready to brung up. Skyler, getting above center table. Well, bring it in, Ezekiel, and the country be hanged. Hamilton, coming down right of Skyler and taking his arm. Father, I wonder if they feel as strongly as you do about the location of the capital. Skyler, raising his hand to strike the small table and breaking out. Why, any man with an ounce of... Out in the cool air, Father. Pushes him onto the balcony. Oh, General, I've noticed that there sometimes comes a moment in diplomatic conferences when a little diversion is most valuable. Should I call for you, come in. <clears throat> Skylar grunts. And look pleasant. I'll see them, Ezekiel. Ezekiel exits right. Hamilton goes to his table, and picking up manuscript of his bill, returns to window and calls. Father, if I could only get hold of Jerison and Monroe... To back your assumption, Bill? Yes. If you could only get hold of the moon. He goes out, closing the windows. Hamilton, with sudden resolution, comes down left of his table and is facing right when Zekiel brings in Monroe and Jefferson. They bow to each other. Zekiel crosses at back to left. Secretary Jefferson and Senator Monroe. Hamilton, bowing to them. Mr. Jefferson. Senator Monroe. Monroe, left of Jefferson. How do you, Hamilton? Jefferson, advancing to center. Citizen Secretary, I trust we do not call at an inconvenient or unseasonable hour. Your time, gentlemen, could not have been better chosen. Zekiel, a bottle of wine. A bottle of wine and a sandwich, yes, sir. Exit Zekiel, left. And Mrs. Hamilton is not back yet. Hamilton, getting behind chair right of large table, and indicating it to Jefferson. No. My wife will not return, I fear, for a month or more. Will you take this chair, Mr. Jefferson? Jefferson sits right of table. Will you take this one, Senator? Monroe crosses and sits in large armchair. That is the chair General Washington always sits in when he is here. Monroe rises uncomfortably, then sits again. I'll sit here at my desk, if you don't mind. There is general constraint. You're still working. Even in this late hour, Citizen Hamilton? Oh no, this is my recreation. Puts hand on pile of manuscript. And what is your recreation? The establishment of a national bank. It's not constitutional. It will be necessary for the full development of my bill for the government assumption of state's debts. When Roe and Jefferson cough uncomfortably, Jefferson is bland. A very charming room you have here. Very charming. Devilish hot, though. Allow me to open this window. Going to balcony window. I should mention that General Schuyler is on the balcony, if our business is private. No, no, not in the least. Pray consider our visit as quite informal. Hamilton opens window. We came to have a little friendly chat with you. Hamilton, returning to table. Gentlemen. I am indeed relieved to find that you have come in this friendly spirit. It gives me courage to approach you in a perfectly friendly way on a very urgent matter. Jefferson catches Monroe's eye. I trust it may be within our power to be of use to you. Without sacrificing the principles for which we stand. Of course. Hamilton, sitting back of table. President Washington is deeply concerned at the country's neglect to pay its debts. The debts incurred during the war. You mean the neglect of certain states to pay their debts? I mean the neglect of the nation. 
Virginia has paid every cent she owes. That saves the honor of Virginia, but not the honor of the nation. Gentlemen, my bill provides that these debts shall be assumed by the central government. Why do you continue to oppose it? All I need is the support of Thomas Jefferson and James Monroe. What you suggest would be making Virginia help to pay the debt of South Carolina. And South Carolina has three times the debt of Virginia. Hamilton to Monroe. Incurred in gaining Virginia her freedom. Gentlemen, if the interests of the thirteen states continue to clash, there is no hope of established independence. I appeal to you both, as patriots, not to squander the time of the country by the discussion of party interests. We are builders of a nation. Let us build strongly. Let us build on the foundation stone of honor. The nations of the world are watching us. Let them sneer at our youth. Let them sneer at our poverty. But let them never cast a slur upon our honesty. You plead merely for the honor of the nation. I plead also for the rights of the individual. Do you realize that the rights of the people are at stake? Hamilton to Monroe. The right of the people is the right to cast aside personal interests for the greater good of the nation. The only safety for any people is in a government that can command the respect of the world. Striking the table. You mean a monarchy? I mean a republic. Monroe, rising, coming to left corner of table and pounding it. George Washington is trying to set up a monarchy and make himself king. Returning to Washington's chair. He gives it a vicious push with his knee and crosses to right. Hamilton, rising and crossing to right with Monroe. Take this chair. I think you'll be more comfortable. Gives Monroe another chair from back of sofa. It is a hard, uncomfortable-looking little chair. He places it in front of sofa. Monroe, ignoring the chair. Suppose the government should pay the state's debts. The men who lent the money wouldn't get it. Hamilton, about to interrupt. You know as well as I do that the patriots who put up the money to carry on the war has long ago given up all hope of ever being paid by the bankrupt states. That is exactly... Their claims have passed into other hands, sold for a song. But the claims remain, and a promise to pay is a promise to pay. Jefferson, rising, and with firmness. Citizen Hamilton, I am pledged to the people... We cannot pick the pockets of the man who trusts us in order to pay another man's debts. Gentlemen, this is repudiation. The last stage of national humiliation. I have tried to see your point of view. Susan Monroe has tried to see it. Yes, I've tried. Turning away to write impatiently. You have appealed to Congress many times and have always been defeated. The last time by a majority of two. The majority was small, it's true. With a touch of courtliness. Mainly owing, I fear, to the eloquence of your address, Citizen Hamilton. Hamilton, responding with a profound bow. From Thomas Jefferson, that is indeed praise. But I fear my eloquence has interfered with our friendly chat. And that was really what you came for. Turning to Monroe. Some other time. About to turn up stage. Well, Jefferson, time is short. This discussion having arisen, I find myself diffident in seeking your cooperation on another matter. Gentlemen, I beg that you will not deprive me of so great a privilege. Pray sit down again. They sit. You are sure you are comfortable in that chair, Mr. Monroe? Monroe, seated in front of sofa. Yes, thank you. I was never made to occupy a throne. Hamilton, about to respond, but controls himself, and sitting in chair right of small table center. Gentlemen, I am at your service. Jefferson, seated again in chair between tables. You know that the residence bill must be voted on without further delay. I understand that immediate decision is necessary. And I will not disguise from you that I consider the geographical position of the capital a very vital matter. Schuyler appears on balcony at back, coming from left. He stops a moment at the open window, catches what they are talking about, nods his head, and disappears to right. Undoubtedly. 
and we do not underrate your influence, not only with the President, but with Congress, in arriving at a decision. That decision, gentlemen, is a very grave and serious matter. It certainly is. But I think we ought to find no difficulty in reaching an agreement. Now that's talking sense. Skylar returns and lingers in front of open window, with his ear obviously turned to catch the conversation. He is not seen by the others. I am pleased to find that you are willing to meet us in the matter. We should have no difficulty because, to me, and surely to all who have gone into the matter as deeply and seriously as we have, there can be only one possible location for the capital. And that is? Albany. A distinct ejaculation is heard from Skyler outside. He disappears to left. Excuse me, I thought I heard my father-in-law calling. Goes to window and closes it. Albany. That old Dutch town. And why Albany? Hamilton, returning to center behind small table. Because. Oratorically, imitating Skyler. It commands the commerce of the four corners of the earth. Skylar is seen moving outside. He opens the other window, the one nearest the left, and is radiant. But I fear you do not consider... I know much may be said in favor of New York and Philadelphia, but... You talk as if Albany, New York, and Philadelphia were the only places in the Union, sir. Hamilton, surprised. Had you any other place in mind? Hasn't the South as much claim as the North? Certainly not, sir. The South could not possibly be considered. Why not, sir? What's your reason for the North, except you're a Northerner yourself? Hamilton, oratorically. Why, gentlemen? Pulls chair right of small table to back of small table and comes to right of small table. All the great events connected with our glorious struggle for independence cluster about the North. Skylar's face expresses amazement and delight. Hamilton lightly touches his fingers as he enumerates the following. It was here in this city, in Philadelphia, that was signed that immortal document from your hand, Mr. Jefferson, the Declaration of Independence. What's that got to do with it? It was in New York that Washington took his oath of office. Skylar gives great signs of approval. It was there that the government had its beginning, and... And there's not a... There's no reason on earth why the South should have it anyway. All this spoken with great conviction. Schuyler, in great delight, exits to right, remaining between windows. Monroe, rising and going right. The South will make a damned good fight for it. Jefferson, rising. Is that your final word, Mr. Hamilton? My decision in this matter, Mr. Jefferson, is just as irrevocable as that of yours and Senator Monroe, regarding my bill. Monroe and Jefferson exchange a glance, which Hamilton observes. You'll excuse me. I'm sure I heard the general calling. Going to window, center. I'm afraid of the night air for your gout, father-in-law. You'd better be getting home. Enter Schuyler. Jefferson moves away towards left, thinking. Good evening, gentlemen with a profound bow, and greatly pleased. Oh, good evening, Citizen Schuyler. Good evening. Schuyler, passing along toward door upright. I won't interrupt you. I'll just toddle along. Hamilton, following and laughing. <laughs> toddle? With that foot? Schuyler, throwing open the door upright. The foot's better, Alexander. Good night, gentlemen. Excuse me while I see the general to the door. They go off upright. Hamilton closes the door after him. Jefferson, crossing toward center. What do you make of that last remark of his, as irrevocable as our decision regarding his bill? Sounds like an invitation to strike a bargain. Is it worth it? We can't do without him, damn him. Shall we support his bill in return for the capital? It's worth anything to get the capital away from the north. It will be hard to explain this change of front to the people. I've said so much about state rights. You can make some excuse. Well, it will be difficult to explain away. <laughs> Tom Jefferson, you can explain away anything. Give you pen and ink, and there isn't your equal for that in the universe. Besides, we may not have to give up a thing. Moving away to write a little. 
What do you mean? Well, Giles of Virginia has some scheme on. He said if Hamilton got us into a corner... Monroe, Giles is a rascal, and I'll not be identified with any of his underhand schemes. Neither will I. I'll just leave him alone and trust in Providence. Re-enter Hamilton, door upright at back. Monroe crosses Jefferson to left. Hamilton, coming down right of table center. Forgive me for leaving you, although I'm afraid, gentlemen, our interview is at an end. Jefferson, advancing a little to Hamilton. Citizen Hamilton, I have been credited with being a diplomatist. Your valued service as minister to France places that beyond dispute, sir. And I find that in settling arguments of all kinds it is necessary to give and take. The best diplomatist, I presume, being the man who gives the least and takes the most. Jefferson and Monroe laugh slightly. In this instance, Citizen Monroe and myself are prepared to give a great deal in order that the southern states shall not be overlooked. Treated with contempt. With regards to the capital, I have a proposal to make. Hamilton nods his head attentively and comes down in front of Sofa and turns to them. As we cannot agree upon the selection of the city, why not build us a new city, clean and new and full of the ideals of liberty and fraternity? Why choose a city like Albany or New York, marred with the scars of the British tyrant, bristling with the memories of our servitude? Certainly an original idea, a new city. On the Hudson. No, not on the Hudson. On the Potomac, halfway between the North and the South. I regret to have to refuse you, Mr. Jefferson, but as I said, my decision is irrevocable. Going up stage between end of sofa and table center. I think you said as irrevocable as our decision regarding your bill. Hamilton, turning and apparently trying to recall it, did I? I think I did. Suppose we make a concession. Hamilton, coming back to Jefferson. Strike a bargain, do you mean? Well, I wouldn't care to use that word, Mr. Hamilton. No, we won't use it then. We'll call it concession. Moves to front of sofa again. Suppose we pass your bill in return for the capital. Hamilton, with an assumption of astonishment. Why, gentlemen, this is a surprising proposal. I fear I must have time to think it over. Sits on little chair in front of sofa. Monroe, beside Jefferson. You're a quick thinker when you like Hamilton. Yes, when I like the proposal. But I am afraid I am getting the worst of the bargain. Jefferson gives slight movement. Uh, concession. We are offering you something you've been fighting for, for years. You will admit that yours would be the spectacular victory. The capital rested from the north. I do not care for popularity. I am thinking only of what is best for the greatest number. You need my answer now. Can you not give me a week to think it over? A week? Good Lord, Hamilton. Three days. This must be decided now. Hamilton, rising. Very well, gentlemen. I agree. Shall we put it in writing? Going toward table left. I think our oral pledge would be sufficient. Your word is your bond. In fact, I would rather take your word, gentlemen, than the bond of any state in the Union. He bows to them. They laugh. Monroe comes over eagerly and extends his hand. That's a bargain, then. Enter Ezekiel, left, with tray containing chicken decanter of wine, and three wine glasses. Knock is heard off right. He puts tray on table center and exits up right, leaving door right open. Note. Be sure that Betsy's letter is on tray. The dialogue is not interrupted by Ezekiel's entrance. Jefferson, between them, and smiling. Oh, really? I, I, I cannot permit. Let us say a final settlement of our difference of opinion. May I offer you some refreshment? Going to back of center table. Monroe to write. Thank you. Now, Sidden and Monroe will agree that we have already detained you too long. Passing up right of center table towards door right. 
Hamilton is preceding Jefferson when Zeker throws open the street door upright and announces, Count Talleyrand. Enter Talleyrand. Talleyrand, shaking hands with Hamilton and then retiring a little on the right upstage near door. My dear Hamilton, oh, a thousand pardons. I see you have the citizens with you. I intrude. We were about to take our leave. Shaking hands with Hamilton. Good night, citizen Hamilton. Passing to door. We have already made our adieus to. Talleyrand, politely. Citizen Talleyrand. Jefferson exits the street door, which Zekiel is holding open. Zekiel hands him his hat. Talleyrand comes down between sofa and table center, dropping his hat and gloves on sofa. He then moves across to in front of sofa. Monroe, shaking hands with Hamilton. Good night, Hamilton. Goes to room door and turns. That was a damned good proposition of yours. Hamilton, at room door, left of Monroe. Oh, pardon me, gentlemen. The proposition came from you. Monroe, coughing uncomfortably. <coughs> uh, yes. Takes stick and hat from Ezekiel. Exit Monroe and Jefferson through street door upright. Hamilton, slamming room door and coming down excitedly, placing his hands on Talleyrand's shoulders. Talleyrand, I needed someone to drink a toast with me. Here's to the government that's going to pay its debts. Picking up to Cantor. I drink to that because I like to drink, but drinking will not make your government pay. Hamilton, pouring out two glasses. It's going to pay. It's going to pay. Who is going to make it? Hamilton, pointing. Jefferson and Monroe. <laughs> you have reformed them? I have, and never struck a blow. Talleyrand, taking up glass. I drink, then, to Alexander Hamilton, the greatest of them all. Hamilton, taking up glass. That gives you an unfair advantage of the wine. If you will substitute the name of George Washington, I will drink with you. Talleyrand shrugs shoulders. George Washington, yes. Hamilton, holding up glass. To George Washington, the first American. Both are in front of a small table. Well, I will drink anyhow. They drink and put down glasses. Hamilton, good-humored. You never did appreciate the greatness of my general. Oh, yes. He has a great big nose. <laughs> and a great big heart and a great big soul. But the brain, it is yours. <laughs> Hamilton about to interrupt. Don't let's quarrel over your general. I come to say goodbye. You leave by tonight's boat? Yes, or rather it sails since the early hours of the morning. Then you have plenty of time. Taking chair from in front of sofa and sitting right of center table. Sit down and have supper with me. Talleyrand, moving away to left. Oh, no. Well, you Americans take too much food. When you are not doing something else, you are always sitting down to supper. Well, be a good American and sit down, then. Talleyrand, extending hand. No, no. I come to give you one last embrace. I am in haste. I must leave you. Adieu. Giving him his hand. Hamilton, still seated. Why not stop and gossip? I finished my work for tonight. To be frank with you, I have to make my adieu to some, uh, ladies. Hamilton, rising. Oh. <laughs> Your American girls. I find them almost more irresistible than the French. Enter Ezekiel upright with bottle of wine and two wine glasses on tray. Puts them on center table. <laughs> and they're not so far away, eh? Digs him in the ribs. Hamilton, you have finished your work for tonight. Why not come with me? If one is working all the day, is it not right that one should play at night? Hmm? Hmm? Comes over to Hamilton. A little spree, hmm? Hamilton, smiling. Why, what do you call a little spree? Ezekiel is back of a small table and can be seen smiling approvingly. Talleyrand shrugs. Oh, a little spree. <laughs> you are so good, Hamilton, and I love you for it, but I, I see the boy leap into your eyes when I say a little spree. He puts hands on Hamilton's shoulders. Exit Ezekiel upright at the back. Hamilton, laughing and moving away to right. <laughs> Do you? By Jove, I believe I deserve it. Well, we are all of us human, except 
General Washington. Hamilton protesting. Talleyrand. A little spree will do you good. Going quickly back of sofa and getting hat and gloves. Hamilton crossing to table center and picks up Betsy's letter. No, I think not. I think I'll stay at home. Oh, yes, I know. Mrs. Hamilton is charming. Je l'adore, but she is away. <laughs> she is away so long. Hamilton, coming to Talleyrand and pulling himself together. No, no, no. I cannot tempt you. I'm afraid you might. That's why I say goodbye. Takes hand. Sail home as fast as a fair wind will carry you. Your genius is universal, but your morals are indigenous to Paris. Godspeed. They go up. Hamilton opens room door. Ezekiel opens street door. Talleyrand, turning at room door. Hamilton is on his left. Au revoir, dear friend. When I am in France and I think of America, one big figure will come before my eyes. Alexander Hamilton. The man who makes the fortune of a nation in order to get a living for his family. Au revoir. Exit Talleyrand. Hamilton, waving to him. Au revoir. Bon voyage. Comes into the room. Bolt the door, Ezekiel. Ezekiel bolts and chains street door, then enters room, closing room door. Hamilton walks to his table and picks up Bill. Victory. Well now, we'll go to bed, uncle. Sitting at table left and putting away papers. Ezekiel, at room door. For the Lord's sake, Master Colonel, ain't you going to eat no supper? Hamilton, remembering, shuts drawer and comes to behind table center. Supper? Yes. Ezekiel, coming down to right corner of table center. That's about the fourth supper I brought in this night, and you ain't going to eat it. I'm going to eat all that supper, and I'm going to finish this bottle of wine. Picking up decanter. Don't you drink it on empty stomach, it'll go straight to your head. And there's another bottle ain't been touched, and a corkscrew a lying close alongside. Ezekiel, there's a conspiracy amongst you to lead me into temptation. Goes up to Escortier in left corner. Sits, and is putting away papers. You go to bed. Yes, Master Hamilton. Yes, sir. <laughs> Goes up to bookcase, center at back, and picking up an extinguisher, begins to put out the four lighted candles. Lights go down. Ezekiel giggles audibly two or three times. What is it, Ezekiel? What's the matter? Ezekiel, giggling. <laughs> Excuse me, Master Hamilton, but I just couldn't help hear what Colonel Count Talleyrand say to you about going on a little spree. Ah, uh, you mustn't be shocked, Uncle. He didn't mean it. Coming down to table left, sitting and putting papers away in drawers. Law, well, no, I ain't shocked. I think him right, Mars Hamilton. Quite right. What? Ezekiel, working to door upright at back. You all been sticking too close to work. Little spree do your side of good. Uncle. If I been a working night and day, same as you been a doing, reckon I like a little spree myself. Opens door right. Why, you black rascal? That's your age. Well, sir, that am the only thing that'd prevent it, Master Colonel. <laughs> Hamilton, laughing and going quickly towards door right, shouts. <laughs> Get off to bed. Ezekiel exits right, laughing, closes door. Hamilton laughs, walks over to table center, sits, looks at food, feels loneliness, feels heat, Rises, opens window left on the balcony. Takes out handkerchief and wipes brow. Returning to center table, he chuckles at Bill on table left as he passes. Sits down behind center table and is pouring out a glass of wine when there is a faint knocking at outer door, which he hardly hears and attaches no importance to. He is about to drink the wine when the knocking is repeated louder. He puts down the glass and opens room door and listens. It comes again. He goes out and unbolts street door and opens it. Mrs. Reynolds, outside. Is this Mr. Alexander Hamilton's house? Yes, this is Mr. Hamilton's house. Is he at home? Yes, he is at home. What do you want? I want to see him. Won't it do tomorrow? Oh, no. I must see him tonight. Come in. Enter Mrs. Reynolds. He closes street door, but not room door. Mrs. Reynolds wears a short white muslin dress, filmy and simple. It is short-waisted and cut low. Over this a straight blue cape 
with a little hood on back. Her hair is in ringlets. She looks like a sweet little schoolgirl. Her slippers are black with white stockings and black ribbons crossed over ankle. She comes to center above table, taking in the room with a glance. Hamilton follows and is on her right. May I see him? I am Mr. Hamilton. Mrs. Reynolds, wide-eyed. Oh, are you Alexander Hamilton? I thought he was quite old. Why, you're young, aren't you? Hamilton, smiling. <laughs> Not very young. Why, you are. You look quite boyish. It's very late, isn't it? It is rather late for business hours. Were you just going to bed? I think I was. Oh, then I ought not to have disturbed you. When I got to your door, I thought perhaps it might be too late. That's why I knocked with my knuckles instead of with the knocker. Looking at her fingers and half holding them out, but withdrawing them when he shows no particular interest. Yes, I wondered why you did that. Mrs. Reynolds, smiling sweetly. Yes, it hurt them too. It was mighty nice of you to let me in. Hamilton, smiling. What do you want? I hardly like to tell you. Moving down a step. Hamilton, a little nonplussed. What's your name? Reynolds, my name is. Reynolds? Yes. I'm related to the Livingstons of New York State. Hamilton, warmly. Oh. Yes. I've so often heard of you from the Livingstons. Hamilton, shaking hands with her. Yes, the Livingstons are very old friends of mine. Won't you sit down? Indicates chair right of center table. She sits demurely, but with a so-far-so-good look in her eye. He seats himself on the end of the sofa, facing her. Well now, what can I do for you? I want money. Hamilton, astonished. Money? But why did you come to me? Mrs. Reynolds, innocently. Why, I'm an American. I'm in need of money. I thought it the place of the Secretary of the Treasury, of my own country, to help me. Hamilton, turning away for a moment, amused. But, my child, I have no money. Why don't you go to Robert Livingston? He's in Philadelphia now. Mrs. Reynolds, with a quick look away. Oh, is he? But my people are the Henry Livingstons. Oh. Mrs. Reynolds, quickly. My father was in the commissary department during the war. Was he? Yes. Mr. Lewis, his name was. Well, now, what do you want this money for? I want to run away. To run away? From whom? My husband. Your husband? Why, you're a child. I'm 26. I don't look it, do I? Oh, he's been nothing to me for a long time. But tonight, he came to my lodgings where I've been living. And he struck me. Here. Touching her breast. So, I thought, if you could give me the money, that tomorrow I'd go to New York. And tonight? Oh, I can go back to my lodgings. With a Madonna-like simplicity. He won't come there again tonight. Hamilton, leaning forward. What did you say your name was? Mrs. Reynolds. Uh, Maria is my first name. <laughs> At home, I was always called Joy. Joy? Yes, Joy. But I haven't had much joy since I married. Oh, but I want it. I want joy and happiness. Hamilton, after a pause, rising and moving to right, and not quite knowing what to say to her. She glances at him quickly as he does so. Things will look brighter tomorrow. Bending over her. Mrs. Reynolds, despondently. No, I've waited for years for things to be brighter tomorrow. I fear you are very tired. I am with a side glance at the things on the table. I had nothing since morning. Haven't you? Suddenly remembering. Why, neither have I. Coming down right a step or two. Uh, nothing to eat since morning. Rising. Oh, you poor boy. Putting her arms on his, and then going quickly to back of center table. Oh, why, you've got all sorts of things here. And wine. Will you have a glass of wine? Mrs. Reynolds, left of table and above it. Oh, yes, I love wine. He gives it to her, laughing. She drinks. Oh, I, I don't think I should have had it. I've had nothing to eat. In that case, I believe it goes straight to the head. They laugh. Mrs. Reynolds, putting down glass. Aren't you going to have one? Yes, I'm going to have one. 
Here's wishing that joy may come back into your life. Drinks the glass he had already filled when the knock came. Mrs. Reynolds watches him and comes down a little in front of table. Do you know what it is to be lonely? Hamilton, at right corner of table. I do. I've been very lonely sometimes. Mrs. Reynolds, going to him. I believe you're lonely now. I believe I am. Two lonely people, alone. Have you nobody here to talk to? Nobody. But you. Recovering. And that is why I'm going to send you away. But first, you must have some food. Moving to back of center table. Mrs. Reynolds, gently. Oh, no. Not if you're afraid of my staying. I see you think it isn't right. Backing away a little towards left. I think it's better not. But you must have some food. Mrs. Reynolds, passing her hand over her brow. Uh, no, no, thank you. Uh, I will go. Moving over to right of him. Hamilton, coming down a step. But I can't let you go like this. No, I see I was wrong. I had no right to ask you for money. But I don't like to... No, thank you. I I'll go. I... She reels slightly, falling into his arms. Hamilton, catching her. What's the matter? Mrs. Reynolds, recovering, dazed. Oh, I don't know what's come over me. I feel so hot and funny. Well... Looks for a place to seat her. Sit here. Sits her on sofa. Mrs. Reynolds, looking up at him. <laughs> it must have been the wine. They laugh. Hamilton, having one knee on sofa, steps over sofa and comes behind her, arranges pillows at head of ditto. Rest here a moment. Mrs. Reynolds, reclining and feeling her face. I feel my face, how it's burning. Takes his left hand and puts it on her left cheek, using her right hand to do so. I'll get you some water. As he goes, she watches him and takes cloak from her shoulders with a quick movement, which shows the audience she is acting. He goes to left upper end of table left and fills a glass of water from a decanter and brings it over to her. She looks up at him very appealingly and then slowly takes the glass in her right hand and sips. It's wonderful to be with someone who is kind to me. Passing the glass into her left hand and giving it to him. He takes it in his right hand. Are you feeling better? Bending over her. Mrs. Reynolds, subtly getting her fingers into his right hand, he takes the glass in his left. Yes, yes. Let me stay. Just a moment. She holds his hand very unconsciously and rests a moment with eyes closed. Now I'll go. Hamilton, bending low over her, recovers himself with an effort. I'll call my old negro servant. He shall take you home. Puts glass on center table. Mrs. Reynolds, rising quickly and gathering cloak around her. Oh, no, no! What would he think? No, I'll go. Thank you. But I can't let you... Mrs. Reynolds slightly reels. I'll see you to your door. Takes his hat and cloak from corner of bookcase up center at back. Puts cloak on. Mrs. Reynolds, with a triumphant gleam in her eyes. Will you? Oh, but Mr. Hamilton, I couldn't dream of taking you out at this hour. It's so late. Moves up left of sofa. Hamilton, coming down to her. That's why I can't let you go alone. Feels her thin cloak. But I'm afraid you'll be chilly in the night air. Putting his hat on and taking a second cloak from chair right of bookcase center it back. Here, put this around you. Puts it around her. Mrs. Reynolds, cuddling into it. They bump slightly and both laugh. Is it one of yours? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and very big for you. Stands left of her. It's very cozy. Now. May I take your arm? Takes his right arm with her left. Why, you're feeling much better. Oh, yes. I think you had better have another glass of wine. Oh, no, thank you. Just take me home. Oh, isn't it wonderful to be taken home by Alexander Hamilton? They go up toward street door upright. Hamilton is seen arranging the cloak at her head and opening the street door. They exit laughing as the curtain falls. End of Act Two Act Three of Hamilton by Mary P. Hamlin and George Arliss Act Three Scene, same as in Act Two In October of the same year There are flowers about, accentuating the feeling that the woman of the house has come back. 
The furniture is all placed as at the rise of the second act. On the mantelpiece upstage end is a small vase of autumn flowers. On small table above fireplace, large bowl of autumn flowers. On bookcase, center at back, a vase of goldenrod. On bookcase left, a small vase with yellow flowers. And on Hamilton's table, a glass bowl of violets. Washington's chair is placed a little further to left. The chair against wall below door left is removed and placed at left of Hamilton's table. The small chair back of sofa is placed under small table at window on right. A chair similar to the other chairs in the room is placed back of sofa. There are fresh lace curtains at windows. Betsy is discovered on steps at center window, hanging last pair of curtains, assisted by Ezekiel, who stands left of steps. She is in the highest of spirits and laughs at Ezekiel's fears for her safety. <laughs> now, Ezekiel, catch these curtains when I drop them. I certainly do wish you'd let me come up them steps. Step of you, Miss Betsy. Why, you dear old darky, you stay where you're safe. You've come all across the ocean, and you're still alive. Don't want nothing to happen to you no sooner you'll get on terra firm. When you'll come home last night, I certainly was glad to see you, and Miss Angelica, too. And Mars Hampton has been jumping about like a schoolboy ever since. Now, catch. Drops curtain. And remember, Zekiel, when you get married and have a house of your own... Me get married. <laughs> Yo sure is amusing. Guess if I ever get married, I won't have nothing of my own. <laughs> Remember, if you have lace curtains, you have clean ones. Enter Angelica Church in street clothes. Door upright, apparently coming from the street. Why, Betsy Hamilton. Closing door and to center. I called to see if you were up. I see you are. Betsy, up on the ladder. Angelica Church, the next time you have scarlet fever, I hope you'll have it in your own country, and not drag me over to England to nurse you. The state of this house is beyond belief. Mounting another step. Betsy, if you're going to mount any higher, you'd better let me come and hold those steps. Goes to steps right of them. Now, Ezekiel, take those curtains and give them to Mary for the wash. I will do that, Miss Betsy. Moving to door left. I certainly do hope Mars Hampton don't come in and find you risking your life your first day home. Exit Ezekiel left. How you can do it, I don't know. I felt the motion of the boat all night. I wouldn't do that if you paid me. <laughs> if I could afford to pay you, Angelica, I'd employ somebody who knew how. Angelica shakes steps in retaliation. Ah! Angelica, coming down center a little. Where's Amiable? Angelica, I don't think it's fair that you should have a pet name for my husband. Well, I've always called him Amiable, because it fits him so much better than Alexander. Where is he? I sent him to walk three times around the common while I took down those curtains. He's a darling. I wonder you can bear to let him out of your sight. Betsy, sitting on top step. I can't, dear, I can't. Oh, I'm so glad to be home. But when I came in here this morning, I couldn't see anything but those dirty lace curtains, so I had to send him out. <laughs> and then it'll be nice to see him come in again, won't it? Sitting on end of sofa. How do you think he looks? Hale and hearty. Do you? I thought he was looking quite thin and pale. Oh, because you've been away, of course. Well, I'm very sorry, but I think he looks fat and well. I ought not to have left him. You're terribly in love, aren't you? Coming up to ladder. I am, Angelica, and I can't get over it. You know Alexander is the most wonderful man in the world. Angelica, back to center. Is he? What about my husband? Oh, well, John Church is a dear old thing, but you couldn't possibly be terribly in love with him, could you? Besides, he's an Englishman. What do you mean, Betsy Hamilton? I am terribly in love with him. I know you are, dear, but you couldn't possibly love John as I love Alexander. And why not? Well, he's a dear, but he has no brains. Now, has he? He has very good brains. <laughs> For an Englishman. Moves in front of sofa, removing shawl. 
Besides, he's easier to manage that way. Drop shawl on head of sofa. He's very nice and he's very rich, but he isn't Alexander. Well, as I prefer having a husband to myself, it's just as well he isn't. <laughs> they both laugh. Angelica sits end of sofa. Betsy resumes her work. Betsy, it's sheer nonsense you're going on doing all the work in this house as you do. I like it. You don't like it and you know it. A daughter of General Schuler doing this kind of work? It isn't right. Well, you know Alexander's salary, don't you? Three thousand dollars a year. Why don't you let father make you a decent allowance? Alexander would rather die than take a penny from anyone. Then why don't you make him give up working for his old country and let him work for himself and for you? Rising and crossing to back of table left. Father says you could make $20,000 a year easily as a lawyer in private practice. Betsy, dusting panes of glass. The life of this republic is dearer to him than anything else in the world. Oh, dearer than his wife and family, I suppose. Picking up paper. There's no question of that. I know his ambitions, and I'm proud to be helping, if it's only in this way. Angelica, throwing down paper disgustedly. Three thousand dollars a year? How do they expect him to provide for you? The government ought to be ashamed of itself. Shakes steps. Betsy, balancing herself on the top step. Ah, oh, if you get so excited at the bottom of these steps, I shan't need anybody to provide for me. Enter Hamilton, right door. Hat and cane. He carries a rose. Slamming door behind him. Betsy Schuyler, come down at once. What on earth are you doing up there? Betsy, beaming at him. I wanted to get a good view of you as you came in, dear. Hamilton, putting stick against wall right of bookcase at center back. Come down, madam, immediately, or I'll come up and fetch you. Putting hat on bookcase. Betsy, extending both arms invitingly. I dare you to kiss me. He dashes for the steps. Angelica, intercepting him at right of ladder. Now, if there's any kissing to be done, you start at the bottom of the ladder. Mwah. I've left my husband in England, and I'm starving to death. Mwah. Good morning, amiable. He kisses her. I'm coming down. Descends hurriedly. Angelica, laughing, moves to left. I hadn't the heart to refuse her, Betsy. Embraces Betsy fondly. I've been starved so long myself. He kisses Betsy and then gives her a rose he has brought with him. They come down stage together, he being on her right. Angelica also comes down on Betsy's left. Ezekiel enters left, removes ladder onto balcony, and exits on balcony toward right. Well, my duties as overseer being finished, I suppose I ought to go. But as I only got a glimpse of you last night, amiable, I'm going to stay and share you with Betsy for the next five minutes. Shall we let her? Yes, yes, let's be kind to her. Sits sofa. Betsy sits on his left. Well, the vanity of these men. Now, tell me all you've been doing since Betsy went away. Sitting on sofa, right of Hamilton. You've only got five minutes, you know. I'll stay ten. Even then, I'm afraid he will have to leave some things out. Ah, those are the things I should like to hear. Well, what have you been doing? Hamilton, his arm around Betsy. Well, now, I'll tell you. But pay great attention. These are state secrets. Part of my time has been spent in trying to save this country from rack and ruin. What's rack? Order, Mrs. Church. I know what ruin is. It's the salary your country pays you for saving it. Order in court. If you're the judge, you've no right to be embracing that lady. Betsy is nestling during this. I'm not the judge. I'm only the supporting counsel. But most of my time. Ah. Hamilton, removing his arm and turning to Angelica. Most of my time has been spent in trying to find the things that Betsy put away before she went away. Betsy, turning him toward her. Why, Alexander, I put everything in its proper place. That's what caused all the trouble. That's why I could never find anything till I had looked everywhere else. Now, if that isn't just like John Church, husbands are all alike. Hamilton, looking at Angelica, 
Then turning to Betsy. You seen her husband, Betsy? Yes, dear. Has she any right to make that statement? No, dear. Am I like her husband? No, dear. Assuming horror at the thought, Angelica rises. Then the court discharges her with a caution. We will proceed with the next case. Folds Betsy in his arms and kisses her. For which I presume no witnesses will be called. Well, I'll go back to my father. Crossing and taking her shawl. Oh, don't go, Angelica. Angelica, turning. Well, I won't, because my father's coming here to fetch me. Moves the door left. But I'll go into the kitchen and talk to Mary and Ezekiel. Hamilton makes movement, rises. No, don't leave the bench, Judge. I can open the door of my cell. <laughs> Exit left, laughing. Betsy. Kisses her fondly, then sits, placing his arm around her. Betsy, fondly. You're a real lover, aren't you, dear? They've been long months without you. It seemed as though you were never coming back. It was dreadful of me to stay away so long. But you know I couldn't help it. You must never, never go away again. I never will, dearest. Mm. But now that I am back, I'm going to be a dreadfully expensive wife. I'm going to take away all your savings. There are no end of things wanted for the house. And of course, I haven't got a rag to my back. <laughs> Hamilton, laughing uneasily. <laughs> well, Betsy, we'll pay a visit to the rag shop first, and the house can wait. No, no, we'll do the house first, and I'll wait. But you must have untold wealth hidden away. Why, there's two quarters salary since I've been gone, and no wife to spend it for you. Hamilton, distressed. Betsy, I've had some unexpected expenses recently, but next quarter... Why, it's all right, dear. Everything can wait. Only I didn't know. I thought you'd been at home, busy, and hadn't much opportunity of spending. I've had some expensive presents to make. Diplomatic presents, you know. <laughs> oh, bribes. Hamilton, glancing at her quickly. I'm afraid it almost amounts to that. That doesn't sound like you, Alexander. I can't bear to think. Knock heard. They rise. Now, here's somebody coming to take you away from me, I suppose. Hamilton, embracing and kissing her. This is your day, Betsy, and wild horses shall not drag me from you. Schuyler, off stage. Wait a moment, Judge. I'll see if he's at home. Mr. Hamilton at home, Uncle. Ezekiel, off. Walk right in, sir. Ezekiel opens room door and admits Schuyler and Chief Justice Hay. Betsy to center, Hamilton right. Jay follows Schuyler. The street door is also open. Before Jay enters, Betsy hurriedly removes her apron and throws it to Hamilton, who throws it to Ezekiel when Jay has passed down. Ezekiel exits right, closing room door, also street door. Schuyler, coming to center behind Betsy, Here's Chief Justice J. Alexander. I met him on the doorstep. Betsy, upstage, curtsying. How do you do, Judge J? Mrs. Hamilton. Bowing near door upright and coming down. I'm delighted to welcome you back. Kisses her hand. Schuyler to Betsy. Good morning, my dear. Good morning, father. Kisses him. They come down, Betsy on his left. Hamilton, giving his hand. Judge Jay, it is good of you to honor us with a visit. Jay comes to Hamilton. You've been away. Jay, down right in front of Sofa. Yes, for a month. On my return, I went first to General Washington, whom I now find installed in Colonel Frank's house at Germantown. Yes, the place was available as temporary executive quarters. I then came to pay my respects to Mrs. Hamilton and to congratulate you on your having converted... Jefferson and Monroe to the support of your bill. Shaking Hamilton's hand. That is gradually filtering through to the other states, eh? Alexander's a wonder. Extends hand. Hamilton crosses to center and takes it. You know, Jefferson and Monroe have withheld the news of their capitulation as long as possible. They're desperately afraid of what their followers will say. It's amazing. I didn't believe that Jefferson would yield one inch. After all his yelling and shouting about the rights of man, 
Alexander's a wonder. Taking out his snuff box and taking a pinch. Jay, laughing. What excuse will he make to his constituents? <laughs> Hamilton. Schuyler on his left, Jay on his right, Betsy on his left. He'll just take his pen in his hand and write a cantata and his constituents will lift up their voices and sing. All laugh. Sing what? Handing Hamilton snuff box, who does not take any, but holds the open box for Jay, who takes a pinch. Jefferson's praises, of course. How did you do it? Bribery. Bribery and corruption. You didn't give Mr. Jefferson your two-quarter salary? No, my dear. I gave him the capital of the United States. Handing snuff box back to Schuyler. But there isn't one. <laughs> That's what made it so easy. Laughter. Goes up center. Ah, uh, if it could only have been in Albany. Jay, with a touch of indignation. Albany? Why, put the capital at the other end of the river. It should be in New York. Hamilton, coming down between them, laughing. <laughs> Let us resign it to Jefferson, on the Potomac. It's a long way from civilization, and the river will carry off the refuse of debate. The representative of the separate states can pour their slander and vituperation into the Potomac, until they damn it, while the Hudson will remain unrestrained to carry on the business of the country. They all laugh. Hamilton goes back of table, left. Schuyler goes toward sofa and sits on left end of it. Betsy, curtsying to Jay. Good morning, Your Honor. I must tell you that my husband has promised this day to me. Are you on business, Judge Jay? Jay, downright. I think I shall not detain you long. Then, my dear. Coming to her by right of table. Betsy, smiling. You said wild horses should not drag you from me. I think the judge hardly comes under that class. You see, he is controlled by the harness of the state. <laughs> Which makes him a very tame horse indeed. In ten minutes, then, I shall take the reins and drive you away. Exits left, brightly. He follows her to door. You must be proud of your daughters, General Schuyler. Proud? Why, since they've been back, my bosom has so swelled with pride that my foot has sunk into insignificance. Hamilton taking chair from left of table and placing it left center in front of table. Will you sit down, judge? Indicates chair, right of table. There was something you wished to say to me. J, coming to chair, right of table. Yes, uh, yes. <clears throat> what a very pleasant room you have here. I'm beginning to doubt it, Judge J. J, surprised. To doubt it? Why? Sits right of table. That is precisely the remark Mr. Jefferson made when he had something unpleasant to say to me. Sits left center in front of table, but facing somewhat toward Jay. You are right. I have something that it is not easy to say to you. Do you wish me to go, Judge? No, General. I very much desire that you should stay. Mr. Hamilton, it is sometimes difficult to determine how far a public man realizes the extent of his influence on the character of others. You are a modest man, but I think you must know that the eyes of the nation are turned toward you as an honorable man who is to steer this country clear of grave dangers. I am, at any rate, conscious of great responsibilities. That is so. Great and grave responsibilities. No one but yourself can persuade the government to assume the debts of the states. The value of the cooperation of Jefferson and Monroe on that issue cannot be overrated. Yes, the Anti-Federalists are with you on that issue as long as they have to be, but it is my belief that they are looking for a loophole, a way out. What makes you believe that? Pause. Hamilton waits. I will be frank with you. I have been several times annoyed by the receipt of anonymous letters threatening exposure of some scandal connected with the Secretary of the Treasury. I wish you to remain, General Schuyler, because I want it understood that my confidence in Colonel Hamilton is unbounded. I have traced these letters to a man named Reynolds. Oh, yes. You know him? Yes. He was recently arrested for perjury in connection with a state case. Do you know anything of the case? No, but the prosecution was made to the Treasury Department, and he wrote to me, begging me to use my influence to obtain his release. And you refused? Yes, I refused. Had he any reason to believe that you would help him? Yes, 
good reason. Why did you refuse? Because I have never used my public office for my private ends. By that I understand that the man has some claim upon you. Yes. It has come to my knowledge that since his arrest, certain papers or letters have fallen into the hands of Senator Monroe, and that some information has been passed on to the unscrupulous Giles of Virginia. Enter Ezekiel upright. Senator Monroe and Mr. Giles to see you, sir. Jay and Schuyler look toward each other. Hamilton, rising. It looks as if your information were correct, Judge Jay. Jay, rising. I'll take my leave. Excuse me. I ask you both to remain. Show them in, Zekiel. Exit Zekiel. Hamilton places chair back left of table. Jay, meeting him in front of table and taking his hand. Understand, Hamilton, my confidence in your integrity is unshakable. Enter Zekiel. Jay to left. Senator Monroe and Mr. Giles. Enter Monroe and Giles, upright. Hamilton, down center, and bowing. Gentlemen, you honor me. Exit Zekiel, door upright. Monroe, coming down. I'm sorry if I interrupt you, Mr. Hamilton, but my errand is important. Hamilton meets them center. Giles, on Monroe's right. How do, Hamilton? Schuyler shows annoyance at Giles's loud manner. Mr. Giles. Bows. Citizen J. Senator Monroe. They bow. How do, Judge? J doesn't bow to Giles. Judge J called. Won't you sit down, Mr. Monroe? Monroe sits right of table. Giles remains standing. Judge J called to express his pleasure at your cooperation in connection with the state's debts. J sits left of table. Yes, I trust we shall have no reason to alter our decision on that point. Hamilton, standing back of table. I too trust that you will not find it expedient to break your word. It's not a matter of breaking words. It's a matter of public opinion. Oh, I was not referring to you, Mr. Giles. Everybody knows that you would never be guilty of a breach of faith. Ugh. Moves across right in front of sofa. Unless it were made absolutely worth your while. Giles, turning. That remark is uncalled for, sir. True. Tell me, Mr. Giles, what have you called for? We have called Citizen Hamilton on business of a private character. Do you wish us to be alone? I think you would prefer it. Ezekiel enters upright, announcing, Mr. Thomas Jefferson. Enter Jefferson to center. Monroe and Jay rise. Hamilton greets him center. Mr. Jefferson. You will excuse me, Citizen Hamilton, but I receive a note from Citizen Monroe asking me to meet him here at this hour. I trust I do not intrude. I told Mr. Jefferson that the business was urgent. Otherwise, I assure you, I should not have taken this liberty. Hamilton to Monroe. Does your business relate to my public office as Secretary of the Treasury? It does. Then I am gratified that you are here, Mr. Jefferson. And I shall ask you, gentlemen, to allow Chief Justice Jay and General Schuyler to remain. Monroe, stiffly. If you wish it. Hamilton, taking chair from behind sofa and placing it center. Jefferson shakes hands with Schuyler and then sits. Pray be seated, Mr. Jefferson. Monroe and Jay sit. Hamilton to back of table. Mr. Hamilton, I am compelled to ask you if you are acquainted. It may facilitate matters if I say that I am acquainted with a man of the name of Reynolds. Giles, standing down right in front of sofa. James Reynolds? I'm not sure of his first name. He is hardly an intimate acquaintance of mine. I believe it is James. You probably know him as Jim. Won't you sit down? Giles does not hear him. Hamilton repeats. Won't you sit down? Indicates a large chair left. Giles crosses and sits. Hamilton sits back of table. The man Reynolds has placed in my hand certain letters which show that he has recently received from you considerable sums of money. You are apparently in his confidence, Mr. Monroe. Those letters were brought to us unasked. I see. The letters were also uncalled for. You say you are not intimately acquainted. What was that money paid for? 
May I be allowed to see the documents in question? Monroe takes them from his pocketbook and hands them to Hamilton. Giles, after Hamilton has looked at a few of them. What was the money paid for? Didn't your friend tell you? I mean, before he was arrested for perjury? He's not my friend. I never saw the man till he came to me on the subject of these letters. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. Crosses his leg uneasily. Looks under seat. That is George Washington's chair. Giles angrily pulls chair around to face Hamilton. There seems to be no doubt that you paid him the money. There seems to be no doubt about that. Mr. Hamilton, I should not be here if I had not been forced by the facts before me. But I cannot disbelieve the evidence of my own eyes. There are your letters proving that the money was paid to Reynolds, and we are compelled to ask you why you paid it. Who compels you to do that? Our sense of duty, Citizen Hamilton. Duty to whom? To the country, to the people, to the citizens of this republic. This has nothing to do with the country or the people. This is my own private affair. We know why you paid the money. Reynolds told us. Oh, you know, do you? Yes, we know. Then you haven't come for information, but merely for the love of sport. That money was paid out of the Treasury of the United States. It was paid out of my own personal account. That we shall require to have proved. But you know what it was paid for. Yes, I know what it was paid for. And from what Mr. Giles says, you know also. Opening drawer of table, drawer on right. I do. It was paid to this man that he might buy up the state's paper, the state's debts. Hamilton, stopping opening drawer quickly. What do you mean? That he might buy up the state's debts for your benefit. Hamilton, rising. What? A stock-jobbing gamble. Come, come, Mr. Monroe. You have only the man's word for that. The word of a man who was arrested for perjury. Monroe, turning to Schuyler. Reynolds gives conclusive evidence that Mr. Hamilton gave him advance information of the proposed government assumption of state's debts, that he gave him the money to buy up the paper at bargain prices, and that his share in the spoils will be five million dollars. Turning to Hamilton and striking table. Hamilton, genuinely surprised. So that's what he told you, did he? That's the reason for the whole thing. And there are the proofs of the money you gave him. Pointing to paper in Hamilton's hands. Hamilton, after a pause, and looking through letters. Thirty dollars. Twenty-five dollars. One hundred dollars. Very modest amounts for purposes of speculation. Very. Just as dishonest to steal ten dollars as ten millions. You can't dodge, Hamilton. I owe it to this country to expose this damned business. You use your official information to rob the patriots who raised the money to save this nation. No, no! Mr. Monroe. He makes them believe their loans will never be paid, and then he hires his man to buy up their claims and hoodwinks us into passing his bill for him. Senator Monroe, we entirely lack proof of this. Gentlemen, let us try to be frank with one another. You have come here today not because you believe me guilty of this accusation, not because you feel any duty to the public, but because you repent the bargain you made with me to vote for my bill. You are afraid of your own party. Your courage has failed you, and you believe this to be a tremendous opportunity to free yourselves from your promise. Jefferson protests. That is the true statement of fact, Mr. Jefferson, whatever you may think to the contrary. You dislike me. You are afraid of me. And this is part of an organized conspiracy to force me to resign, and so to end your difficulties. This is not the first time that you have accused me, but it is the first time that I have been unwilling to strike back at you. Time and again you have charged me with dishonesty in the Treasury. Three months ago you set the trusty Giles on to covertly accuse me of cooking the accounts. Within ten days, as you know, after going through endless records, 
I proved that there was no shadow of foundation for your accusation, and you slunk away whipped and defeated. And now here you are yelping at my heels again, and ready to tear me to pieces. This time you are bolder. You come to me with an open accusation of absolute dishonesty. This accusation is based on the evidence of one James Reynolds, an obscure and worthless man. Had I desired to defraud the treasury, should I have been driven to the necessity of unkenneling Reynolds to assist me? Gentlemen, it is not a reasonable accusation. If I felt that you really believed that this was even remotely connected with my office, I should not hesitate to give you proof to the contrary. But you know that what you accuse me of has no foundation in truth. Pause. I admit that I had transactions with the man Reynolds. Movement of interest from others. But they were of a private nature, and I swear that my connection with him is in no way bound up with my public office. I make an appeal to your sense of justice, and I ask you, gentlemen, to drop this investigation. J. After a slight pause. In deference to Mr. Hamilton, I think, gentlemen, that should close the matter. But there is no question of the honor of Alexander Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton has indeed made a very moving appeal. If the facts are not as stated, why not tell us what they are? Because such disclosure would be useless to you, and would cause much suffering to some who are very near and dear to me. Jefferson, as if about to rise. Well... In that case, Citizen Hamilton. But I don't see how... Do you mean it's a domestic affair? Hamilton, uneasily. In a sense, yes. Something that affects your wife? Hamilton, restraining himself. Yes, sir. Something that affects my wife. There is a moment of embarrassment. Monroe shows that he does not wish to proceed. Giles, rising. Mr. Hamilton... As a trusted representative of the state of Virginia, I feel it is my duty to ask you a few questions. Hamilton looks at Giles hard for several moments and then sits. Great restraint. Yes. In the first place, in what way is your wife mixed up? Hamilton, springing up and striking table, furious. Stop. There shall be no more of this. I am ashamed of the act that has led to this inquiry, but I am more ashamed of my cowardice in begging your charity. You shall have the facts. During the absence of my wife abroad, I became intimate with Mrs. Reynolds. Sensation. It doesn't matter how or where, but the thing happened, to my eternal disgrace. Since that night, I have been paying hush money to the man Reynolds. He has never ceased to blackmail me. Taking letters from drawer. Here are his letters with demands for money. They form the sequel to those which you now hold. And here are three or four love letters from Mrs. Reynolds, which I am sure you will enjoy reading. Throwing them on table toward Giles, shutting drawer and moving across to extreme right at the back and back again. Schuyler, rising, thunderstruck, Alexander! Father, I have no excuse to make. Giles picks up the letters and crosses quickly and shows them to Jefferson. Jefferson turns away, saying, No, no. Giles then turns to Monroe. Monroe takes the letters and throws them on the table, saying, I prefer not. Hamilton comes back of table. Since this accusation has been made, I must insist on your reading all these documents. These are his and these are hers. They both form part of the plot in which you are now involved. You will find no mention of state debts in them. Her letters are an attempt to drag me into a prolonged intrigue, and were necessary for the full effect of his blackmailing. Looking at Giles, who was standing center between Monroe and Jefferson. A conspiracy from beginning to end. A conspiracy to discredit Washington's administration and my office. Will you read them, or do you condemn me to read them to you? He pulls off the tapes from her letters and is about to read. Betsy, heard off left, calling. Alexander? A moment of suspense. Betsy, enters door left. Alexander? Oh, I beg your pardon, gentlemen. I thought he had gone. 
The men rise, and there is an awkward pause. But this was to be my day with my husband. Won't you let him off till tomorrow? We've been parted so long, you know. Won't you, Mr. Jefferson? She is down left in front of table. Jay moves up center and meets Jefferson and Monroe. They make a group there. Giles moves to right in front of sofa. Schuyler has worked across at back and is coming down left. Hamilton, coming by left of table to her rapidly. In a few moments, dear. In a few moments, and then I'll come. But you look so tired, dear. So tired and old. I've never seen you look old before. I've grown old in your absence, dear. I'll come in a few moments. Very soon. And we'll look at the shops, and you'll be my boy again. Hamilton kisses her hand. Yes, dear. Jay, coming to left center. I don't think we need to ask Mrs. Hamilton to withdraw. Our business is over, and I apologize for having kept him so long. You came to take the reins, eh, Mrs. Hamilton? I think I will go before you use the whip. Schuyler has joined Betsy by this time. Jay draws Hamilton away to center. I sincerely regret that you should have been subjected to this. Betsy, down left in front of table, by instinct. Is something the matter, father? Schuyler, on her right, tries to distract her attention. It's all right, my dear. It's all right. Jefferson, quietly to Hamilton. Citizen Hamilton, I'm heartily ashamed of having obtruded myself into this business. I give you my word that not one syllable of this shall ever pass my lips. I'm sorry. I was misinformed. I apologize. They bow to Hamilton, and he follows them as they move toward the door upright. Betsy is conscious of something the matter, and lingers, though you see Schuyler is trying to get her away. Giles, who has been walking restlessly to and fro down right. Wait a minute, wait a minute. They all stop and turn. Jefferson at door, Monroe following. Hamilton center, and Jay center to left upstage. I don't want to speak before Mrs. Hamilton, but this thing hasn't been brought to a satisfactory conclusion. Jefferson, coming back a few steps. Surely there is nothing more to be said. Mr. Hamilton has met you fairly and straightforwardly. Giles, right center in front of sofa. I have nothing to say against Mr. Hamilton, but... <laughs> Monroe comes down right behind Jefferson. Giles, loudly and pugnaciously. I won't be muzzled. I am a trusted representative of Virginia, and it is my duty to do the best for my state. I think, gentlemen, we will not endeavor to restrain Mr. Giles in the execution of his duty. If Mrs. Hamilton will be good enough to retire... Betsy looks towards Hamilton, rather worried and scared. No, gentlemen. With your permission, I shall ask my wife to remain. Sensation. Slight pause. Hamilton moves to chair right of table, but does not sit. Oh, I see. You want to gag me. On the contrary. I am hoping that she will remove the seal from my own lips. You mean you want me to speak out? Yes, I want you to speak out. Giles, slightly taken aback by his tone... Very well. Moves to center. Alexander Hamilton, you don't like me, but I'm going to prove to you that I am your friend. Hamilton glances at him. You don't believe it, but I'm going to prove it to you. What would you say if the newspapers got a hold of this story? Slight movement from Jefferson and Monroe. They exchange a glance of disapproval. Which? My story or yours? Now it's no use getting personal. It isn't my story, it's Reynolds. What would you say if the newspapers came out tomorrow with the story that the Secretary of the Treasury had borrowed the nation's money to speculate with to buy up the state's paper? Hamilton, looking at his wife, who has started and is being restrained by Schuyler. For the moment, I don't know what I should say, Mr. Giles. It wouldn't be any use trying to get your bill through then, not even with Jefferson and Monroe behind you. Public opinion would be too strong. Jefferson, coming in between Hamilton and Giles. Citizen Hamilton, you must excuse me. I cannot stand by while Citizen Giles continues in this way. I wish to express my regret that a representative of Virginia should behave in such a deplorable manner. Bows to Hamilton. I take my leave. Exit door upright and shuts door after him. Monroe is following, but stops at room door as Giles speaks. 
Giles, moving across to right back angrily. Well, Jefferson's words don't alter the facts. At least not with me, they don't. J, left center at back. Is there any danger of the newspapers getting it? Giles, coming to center. There's more than a danger. It's a fact that the advertiser has got the story and is going to publish it in tomorrow's issue unless... Hamilton, in front of chair, right of table. Unless... I think it would be better if Mrs. Hamilton... Mrs. Hamilton is your hostess. You said unless. Well, unless, of course, you deny it, which you couldn't very well because there are the proofs that the money was paid to Reynolds, and you can't explain why. Hamilton, after a pause, and sitting. You've gotten me, haven't you? Now, Mr. Hamilton, if you will withdraw your bill, I'll guarantee that the story shall not be printed. Betsy, crossing to Hamilton. I don't know what foundation you have for your false accusations against Colonel Hamilton, but he must not give up that bill. He's worked and slaved and gained the confidence of all the world with that in view, and he must not give it up. Can you bear the alternative, Betsy? I must bear it. Can you bear that I, the Secretary of the Treasury, should be accused of cheating the people? Bear it? Why, of course, because I know it isn't true. Hamilton, rising. How do you know it isn't true? What do you mean? Because I know you, Alexander. Hamilton, advancing to her. Do you know me? Do you? Tell me what you mean. Hamilton, taking her by the arms. Why don't you suspect me? Why do you trust me? Don't, don't. Tell me what it is. You can't prove it isn't true. I can, but I dare not. You dare not? I dare not tell the truth. I did pay certain sums of money. What for? What did you pay it for? To keep from the light something of which I am ashamed. To hide something shameful from you. Schuyler, down left. Alexander, have you no feeling for your wife? Betsy, go. Hamilton, stepping back from Betsy. Father, it's better that she should know. Betsy. You're not going to drag that woman. Oh! A moment of dead, awful silence. Betsy, turning dazed to Schuyler. It's not a woman? He bows his head. She turns to Hamilton and sees the guilt on his face. Oh! Betsy, my girl. Betsy, lifting her head, dazed, but with a sense of pride... Does anyone else know? Schuyler, quietly. Mr. Jefferson, that is all. Betsy, looking at Monroe and Jay. Will they tell? No. No. Betsy, slowly. Then it need never be known. Then you withdraw your bill. Hamilton, with a great sudden outburst. No, no. I can't do it. I've done with bargains. I've bargained with my conscience long enough. I'm covered with shame and remorse, but I can't stand in the mud and barter what I believe to be America's honor. My bill stands. Get out and tell your story, and I'll tell mine. What'll you tell? The truth. Picks up letters. The whole degrading, sordid truth. In tomorrow's newspaper, I'll publish every fragment of evidence in connection with my disgrace with this woman. If there is to be dishonor, it shall fall on me and not on this administration. I sacrifice my office. I sacrifice my wife. But by God, Betsy, I can't sell my country. With a peremptory gesture to Giles. Now go! Giles goes towards door right and the curtain falls quickly. Picture. Monroe is going. Hamilton Center looking toward door. Schuyler taking Betsy in his arms. Giles is seen going through street door. He glares at Hamilton and bangs the door after him. Curtain. End of Act Three. Act Four of Hamilton by Mary P. Hamlin and George Arliss. Act Four. Scene. A room in Hamilton's house the next morning. It is a lofty anteroom with very large folding doors center, which, when opened, disclose a large reception room beyond. There are doors down right and left and a window upright. 
The room is severe in its colonial dignity, very large panels being either side of the folding door and on the walls right and left. The general tone is of a yellowish cream relieved with gray. A harpsichord is on stage down right center and a chair in front of it. Black console tables with a pair of marble vases stand against the walls right and left of center doors at back. Hanging above the consoles in black oval frames are two old-fashioned pictures of flowers. A three-piece Chippendale settee is against the wall left above the door. Lace curtains and blue rep hangings on window upright. When center doors are opened, you will see a large handsome mantel at back with windows right and left hung with red rep curtains. Two small square tables in front of windows, and a large mahogany table in center in front of fireplace. Ornaments on mantel and vases on small tables. The doors are closed. General Schuyler discovered standing in center of room, dejectedly, with newspaper clutched in hand. Boy calling, paper, heard through window. Boy calls, Federalist, Federalist. Philadelphia Evening Sun, Confessions of Alexander Hamilton. Schuyler goes and slams down window, returns to center and looks at newspaper. Enter Angelica down on right. She has evidently been crying. She goes up to her father and kisses him sympathetically. He instantly puts paper behind back. Where's Betsy? Angelica, right of him. Still in her room. I wish Alexander would come. He's still locked in his study. He's been writing since early morning. Can't you get him out? I've tried. I told him there were people waiting to see him. He called out, let them wait. But this room... Pointing to doors upstage. Is full of men, senators, congressmen, and heaven knows who besides. It's not like him to run away. He won't run away. The thing's done. He's got to face the music. He'll face it. How does Betsy seem now? She's so deadly calm. I wish she'd cry or rave. Be more human. She's determined to go. Yes. I can do nothing with her. Skyler, looking at paper. It's a bad business. A bad business. Putting paper behind him quickly. You needn't hide that paper. I'm not ashamed of it. Skyler, surprised. You're not. Angelica, coming to him. Oh, Father, isn't he wonderful? Who? Alexander. Well, uh... Oh, I wish he were my husband. I should be proud of him. Angelica, if you'd only been a man, if you'd been my eldest son instead of my eldest daughter, I'd have taken you by the hand and called you a fine fellow. Shakes hands with her. But those are hardly the proper sentiments for a young married woman. If he were my husband, I'd show him how a woman can forgive. But he isn't your husband, and that makes all the difference. Don't be hard on Betsy. It's easy enough for one woman to forgive another woman's husband. Enter Ezekiel, door left. Speaker Mullenberg and Mr. Morris has just come. Did you say Mr. Hamilton was engaged? Yes, sir, but they said, like the others, that they'd wait, so I done showed him into the room with the rest of them. Very well, Ezekiel. They ain't going to do nothing to Martha Hampton, is they, sir? No, no, no. Ezekiel going out. Well, I done wish they wouldn't all stand round waiting for him. Exit left. Angelica, upstage right. I'm glad I'm not your eldest son after all, father. What is it now, Angelica? Angelica, indicating toward inner door. If these are fair samples of men, I'm glad I'm not one of the tribe. All waiting around to kick a man when he's down. Crossing in front to left. Enter Betsy, door right, dressed for the street. Oh, there you are, Betsy. Going out. Assumed brightness. Yes, I'm going, Father. Has Alexander come down? Not yet. Where are you going? I'm going to Albany, Father, to wait for you. I'm going home. Won't you stay and see him? Things for him will go on just as if I had not come back from Europe. That is all. He can resume that life. The coach for Albany leaves at noon. You'd better see him, Betsy. I've seen the morning paper. And so have I. Read every word of it. Twice. Well, if your sister's determined to go, you'd better get your things together, Angelica, and go with her. She can't go alone. 
Why don't you go with her? I can't leave Alexander at a time like this. Well, neither can I. Betsy's the only one who can leave him, so she must go alone. Come, come, Angelica. You mustn't talk like that. Betsy, coming to Skylar. Don't, father. I'd much rather go alone. I can't bear to see or speak to anybody. I'm so ashamed. I can't face even you. Going toward left. Angelica, stopping her center. Betsy, take off that hat and stand by him. Are you going to leave that man? Yes. Good. He doesn't need you. He never needed you less. If you can't appreciate his courage and bravery, you are no fit mate for him. God knows there are few enough men who are willing to sacrifice everything for the truth. If you're going, go. Go and join those men in there who are all willing to take a peck at him. Angelica! I know. Alexander's done a wicked, disgraceful thing. That's what makes the difference between a human being and a whitewashed saint. I'm a human being myself, and I'm going to wait here for Alexander. Enter Ezekiel, left. Well? It's a lady calling Miss Betsy. Betsy, interested. Who is it? Ezekiel, lamely. It's, a uh, Miss Reynolds, ma'am. What? 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 Tell her Mr. Hamilton is out. She wants to see you, Miss Betsy. Angelica, indignant. I never in all my life. Skylar, about to go toward left. I'll soon settle her. Wait a moment, Father. I'll see her. Zekiel going. No, no, Zekiel. Betsy, firmly. Show her in, Zekiel. Zekiel exits left. Do you mean to say you're going to see that disgraceful woman? Yes. Will you and Father go away, please? But why? Why do you want to see her? I want to see what she looks like. Perhaps there's something of the human being in me, too. Come on, Angelica. Angelica crosses to right and opens door. I've got two daughters and your dear mother at home, and I'll be hanged if I understand the first thing about women. Excellent Angelica and Schuyler. Betsy, in front of harpsichord, waits somewhat nervously. Enter Ezekiel with Mrs. Reynolds. Mrs. Reynolds. Mrs. Reynolds enters, pretty and demure. She waits for Ezekiel to go, looking to see that he's gone before she speaks. Ezekiel goes off. Betsy stands looking at Mrs. Reynolds. You're Mrs. Hamilton, aren't you? Mighty nice of you to see me. What do you want? Why, of course. You've seen the newspaper. Yes. Mrs. Reynolds, with conscious pride. Yes. It's made quite a stir, hasn't it? I came because I thought you might feel badly about it. I thought you might feel angry with him. With whom? Uh, why, with Mr. Hamilton. I don't see how anyone could. He's so nice, but... <sighs> what is it you want to say? Uh, well, I wouldn't like you to be cross with him. You mustn't blame him, because it wasn't his fault. Uh, whose fault was it? Well, it was mine in the end. But at first, it was Reynolds's. Reynolds? Yes, Reynolds arranged it. Because some of his friends, political gentlemen, wanted to get Mr. Hamilton talked about. And, of course, when I went, I hadn't an idea what he was like. And when I found he was so nice, I half wished I hadn't said I'd do it. But I'd given my word, you see. And then you were away, and I'd never seen you. Coming closer to look at her. You're pretty, too, aren't you? Only in a different way for me, and older. Don't you hate to think of growing old? Mrs. Reynolds, have you no sense of right and wrong? Oh, yes, I know. I know what I'm doing wrong. But you see, I have nobody to keep me straight. A little to center. Do you realize that you have broken this home and ruined a man's life? Isn't the thought of that enough to keep you straight? Mrs. Reynolds, turning and coming back. Oh, you're not going to leave him. You can't do that. That's why I came, because I thought you might be cross with him. Have you no decency? Your name flaming in the newspaper, your shame on the lips of every man and woman in the city. Well, yes, of course it is bad in a sense. But then it's different for me to what it is for you, because it does give me a sort of a position. You see, I've never had any position before, 
And now my name being in the paper, coupled with Alexander Hamilton. Betsy, stifled. Oh, it'll make Reynolds behave a good deal better to me, I know. <laughs> mean old thing. Of course you're good, with a good husband, and you don't understand. I suppose everything depends on the way you're brought up, doesn't it? Oh, I don't mean to be wicked. I wish I wasn't. Good morning, Mrs. Reynolds. Mrs. Reynolds, naively. Oh, that means I'm to go. But you won't leave him, will you? We have nothing more to discuss. Mrs. Reynolds, coming beside her and placing hand on chair. Mrs. Hamilton, I didn't want to come here today and face you. It took some courage, I can tell you. But when I saw his confession this morning, I reckon that took some courage, too. I knew you'd come home, and that you'd see it all in the paper. And I made up my mind that you should know it was all a planned thing. I was set on to get him, anyway. But when I saw him and spoke to him and he thought I was in trouble and was so kind to me, I just fell in love with him. And I didn't mean to let him go. How can you stand there and tell me that? Because I don't want you to be hard on him. He's a good man. But I made up my mind that he shouldn't get away from me. So he isn't to blame, is he? Enter Skylar and Angelica hurriedly right. Angelica goes up to right center at back. Skylar remains at door. Alexander has left his room. I think it would be better if I let this young woman out by the side door. This way, please. Mrs. Reynolds, crossing, turns to Betsy. You won't leave him, will you? Please go. If you only knew more about women, you'd forgive him. Mrs. Reynolds exits with Skylar. As she notices Skylar's forbidding expression, she assumes a nonchalant swagger as she exits. Betsy sinks into chair, weeping. Angelica, coming down to Betsy. Did you hear what that woman said? Yes. I think God put those words into her mouth for you to hear. Enter Hamilton, left. He carries the bill on which he has been working. After a moment's pause. Alexander! Betsy! Hamilton puts his hand up and silences her, looking at Betsy as though to say, Let Betsy speak. Betsy avoids looking at him and goes off right, hurriedly, as though she feared she might break down. Angelica, going to him in tears. Oh, Alexander, you've wronged her cruelly, but you stuck to the truth. Hamilton, taking her hands. It's a great price to pay, but it was the only way, the only way for me. But, oh, Angelica, I've lost Betsy. They move away a little to left together. Enter Skylar, door right. Alexander, you've got to see these people. There's a whole crowd waiting for you. The wolves are clamoring at the door, eh? Well, they'll die of overfeeding. Who are they? Jefferson, Monroe, Madison. Ha! <laughs> of course. John Jay, Robert Morris, John Marshall, Robert Livingston, and others besides. My friends, too. My friends of yesterday. Well, they are right. Have you seen them? Not yet. Ezekiel tried to get rid of them, but they seem to be waiting with grim determination in there, and won't be moved. In here? Going toward doors at back. Well, we'll meet them this way. Turns at doors. You, dear friends, have been my allies. They come to him on either side. I release you. They'll stand alone. Not very strong, morally or physically, but we won't lose our courage. Angelica, dear girl, you have been too good, too indulgent to me, and not fair to Betsy. Coming down a step or two with her. Go and give her what comfort you can. She will need it, at first. Angelica goes towards door right. You'll stay, father? Skylar, testily, to cover his emotion. Get out, get out. Why should I run away? I'm not a senator, thank God. Exit Angelica, right. Hamilton, with hand on door center. Father, after this I shall disappear. I shall probably go back to the West Indies where I was born. I will write to you. You will hear from me, but you won't see me. Here's an end to the Federalist Party and an end to my ambitions. 
My home is in ruins, but the honor of my office has been saved. Breaking down, his head drops for a moment on his arms as he holds the handles of the doors. During that moment, Betsy enters. She has taken off her outdoor clothes. She comes forward to Hamilton with outstretched arms. Alexander? Hamilton turns to her, amazed, comes down and folds her tenderly in his arms. Betsy? Oh, I thought I could be proud and hard, but I can't, dear. I can't. Hamilton, kissing her fervently. My dear one. Kisses her again. Then, to Schuyler, who has come down right of them. Father, will you take Betsy till this... Indicating toward center doors. Is over? No, Alexander. Let me stand by you. Hamilton kisses her hand, and she moves down right. He becomes a different man, and going up he throws open the great center doors. The room beyond is brilliantly lighted, and the entire scene is lighted up. There is a murmur of conversation. The room beyond is filled with men, about a dozen or more. Some are seated. Present are Marshall, Morris, Jay, Jefferson, Monroe, Livingston, Madison, Muhlenberg, etc. Gentlemen, good morning. He bows, and they bow to him. I regret that it was necessary for me to keep you waiting, but the publication of the morning paper did not immediately relieve me of my duties as Secretary of the Treasury, and I had pressing work. But now, gentlemen, I am here for your consumption. Comes down right. Jefferson comes down center, Monroe behind him to left, J to right inside doors. Others form group in center of doors. Colonel Hamilton. You see before you political adherents and political opponents, friends and foes, but I have been requested to act as a spokesman and to express... Mr. Jefferson, I know how painful must be the duty which has fallen upon you. Let me relieve you of it. I am glad you are here, both friends and foes. I know the object of your visit... You have come in advance of President Washington's orders to relieve me of my office. You are justified, and I have no excuses to offer. I am pained and ashamed at this inglorious end of my career. But at least I must still have the courage of my political opinions. Since early morning I have been working to clarify this document. It is the bill of the government assumption of state's debts, without which this country has no honor. It will now be ignominiously defeated. But it is my conviction that the sense of justice of my opponents will one day compel its adoption. And so, Mr. Jefferson, I deliver it into your hands, sir, for safekeeping. Hands document. Jefferson, without taking document. Alexander Hamilton, you have mistaken our mission. I have been asked to tell you that every man in this room, every man in the cabinet, every man in the Senate, is anxious to take you by the hand. Monroe, coming forward and taking his hand, Their admiration for your courage has overwhelmed their knowledge of your indiscretion. You need have no fear for your bill now, Colonel Hamilton. Your action will swing the whole country. I trust I know how to appreciate courage and how to acknowledge defeat. Retires to left. Enter at the back from left two military aides. They remain in outer room and salute Hamilton. Colonel Lear follows them and comes down center. Here is Colonel Lear. Colonel Lear, you come from President Washington. Lear, saluting. Colonel Hamilton, I have the honor to announce that President Washington has left the executive mansion and is now on his way here to express to you in person the high opinion he holds of your integrity. Salutes and retires to Jay. Citizen Hamilton, our political opinions may differ in the future as in the past, but my impression of your conduct in this matter will remain glowing and unchangeable. It is the bravest thing a man ever did. Your vindication of the honor of the Secretary of the Treasury, the servant of the nation at the expense of the honor of Alexander Hamilton the man, 
is a display of personal courage that will rouse the admiration of the world. Said it in Hamilton, I am proud to take your hand. Shakes him by the hand. There is a buzz of approval. Mr. Jefferson, Mr. Monroe, gentlemen, I am deeply moved by the expression of your sentiment toward me. But your decision to support this bill has stirred within me a still deeper feeling. By that decision, you have established the credit and the honor of the United States. You have opened the floodgates of prosperity, a prosperity that will reach far beyond our present vision, a prosperity that will one day make America the market of the world. This is what I have striven for. And so, gentlemen, I tender you my felicitations and my thanks. Turns to Betsy. Curtain. End of Act Four. End of Hamilton by Mary P. Hamlin and George Arliss.